Number 10, Iron Man. I mean, Iron Man has come such a long way since that first classic appearance. He was basically just a guy in a big metal silver suit, after all. Now he's a guy in, well, a big metal silver suit that isn't quite so bulky and actually has a few coats of paint on it. This is because when we first met Tony Stark as Iron Man, he was wearing his very first suit, in issue number 39 of Tales of Suspense. Here, we'd get his origin story, which would explain how Tony Stark was captured and made the suit under the guise of building weapons of war for his captain. When really, he was building the suit to help keep him alive and also help him in his escape. This suit, of course, was built for a specific purpose, that of survival. But over the years, Tony would modify his design and improve upon it, even building various suits for specific events as might be needed depending on the circumstances. His most iconic look, though, often still involves him wearing his slightly more modern, though still classic colors of red and yellow. He went from silver to gold to red and yellow, I believe, although now he has more modern coloring in terms of the red and yellow colors. His armor appears a lot more metallic red and gold, which I love. Although I'm sure in the classic comics it was also supposed to be metallic red and gold, but we just have more advanced, I feel like, color tech in the future, color tech. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here on Top 10 Nerd, and if you love hearing about some heroes that you know you might not be as familiar with or you might not recognize anymore, we also have a playlist where we show you some alternate versions. So go see some other characters that you, you know, you might not know about now. Number nine, Green Arrow. Green Arrow literally looked like Robin Hood back in the day. Well, minus the now, more Robin Hood style goatee that he now sports, because back then I feel like he was usually more clean shaven. Green Arrow is Oliver Queen. Technically his first appearance is no longer even the same Ollie that we have today in the comics, instead relegated to the alternate reality of Earth 2. But still, he was the original Green Arrow, and so if we are talking about classic looks in terms of first appearances, which is exactly what I'm trying to do here. Oliver has made a lot of progress in comparison to his first look and his first self. Currently, Oliver Queen in the Prime Earth main continuity of DC Comics has a much more modern look to him. Well, of course, like I said, minus that classic looking goatee and mustache combo, which is very Robin Hood to me. No longer does he wear a bright green suit with red boots and gloves. Instead, he wears body armor that, while still kind of green is much more muted in tone. And sometimes he wears reddish bracers, which is kind of a throwback to the classic look. But even then, the colors are about where we draw the line when it comes to similarities to that classic look. Well, and obviously he still fights with the bow because he is Green Arrow, so. But that I don't think will ever change. That would be weird if he was like, and now I'm Green Arrow, but I fight with a machete. I feel like that's really random, but all right. Unless it's a machete that he can like shoot like an arrow. Number eight, Thor. Thor has always looked super classic when it comes to his Norse heritage, but now he looks even more cosmic, despite really having always been. As the Asgardians are not people from the past, but are instead considered to be aliens of a kind, simply posing as gods on Midgard, aka Earth, where humans once prayed to Odin and the others. I'm sure some still do. Seeing them as godlike figures. I mean, in essence, they are still considered gods, but they're also aliens, because they're, you know, cosmic, but also divine. I would say that over the years, Thor's stories and overall appearance and costume have also greatly embraced his cosmic origins more and more. Thor also made his first appearance in Journey into Mystery issue number 83, where he also looked a mite smaller compared to his modern day self. I feel like that Thor is so like, the Thor we have now is like, oh, he's like super deezed. And especially if we consider the Thor and Hulk crossover event, Banner of War, Thor also hulks out here himself and even shattered the Bifrost again after becoming infected by Bruce Banner. So there he might look totally different because you'd be like, what? Thor's the Hulk? What's happening? Number seven, Crimson Avenger. I mean, most people might not even recognize the Crimson Avenger just because they don't know him. He's quite a classic hero, appearing on what I believe was DC's second superhero team ever, the Seven Soldiers of Victory which made their first appearance back in the early 1940s in leading comics issue number one. Here, Crimson Avenger was Lee Walter Travis. He appeared here sporting a super form-fitting red outfit with a fin on top and yellow underwear over top, as well as yellow boots to match. This look would seemingly endure until Travis met his end in DC Comics Presents issue number 38. Here, the question of what happened to him would be answered, and we'd learn after being diagnosed with an incurable disease, Lee decided to don his costume one more time and sacrifice himself to save others. Now, while this 
might sound like his original costume because it did sort of come into play super early on. His original costume, however, actually hails from even further back than the 1940s. The Crimson Avenger actually made his first appearance in the late 1930s in Detective Comics issue number 20. Here he sported a suit underneath a red cape with a matching red wide brimmed hat and wielding dual pistols. He died back in the 80s looking very different in comparison to his first appearance. And I guess now you really wouldn't recognize him at all because I don't think we've seen a new Crimson Avenger since, with him remaining dead in regards to comic continuity. Tell me if I'm wrong on that one, but I can't think of a Prime Earth appearance that I've seen. Crimson Avenger? Is he in the Prime Earth? You tell me. Number 6. Robin Jason Todd was once known as Robin. At the time, he was a hero, and while quite stubborn and brash, he did his best to live up to the mantle working alongside Batman. Eventually, however, Jason would end up leaving Wayne Manor and go on a search for his birth mother. During this time, Batman would once again find him just as Jason would find his birth mother. But unfortunately, the Joker would also find Batman and Jason, secretly blackmailing Jason's mother, and in the end, Jason and his mom would end up as the Joker's victims. Jason would seemingly not survive this incident, despite Batman's rush to come to his aid. However, many years later, we learn with the re-emergence of Red Hood that Jason actually hadn't died here, but had managed to survive and return to life, and later Gotham using his new identity, Red Hood. Gone are the days when Jason Todd acted as Batman's sidekick Robin and in his place was Red Hood. At first a seeming villain, then an anti-hero who was unafraid to kill and fought with guns, and now currently a brutal vigilante who instead fights with a crowbar because symbolism. I actually really like Jason fighting with a crowbar, but I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? At number five is the Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn. As if this villain wasn't enough of a contender for Spidey to deal with before, he actually takes on the Carnage symbiote, turning him into the Red Goblin, as mentioned before. This makes him nearly unstoppable, forcing the good guys to employ anti-venom on him in order to take him out for good. And even though he has since gone back to being the Green Goblin, the character takes another turn that makes him unrecognizable from his past self during the events of Kindred Rising. And by unrecognizable, I mean that he's now working with Spider-Man. When Sin Eater cleanses Norman of his sins, his allegiances change and he becomes a hero. At number four, we have Doctor Doom. These days, Doctor Doom has taken on some pretty unstoppable powers that some would even describe as being godlike. Big fan Fans of Victor Von Doom might have expected him to reach a point like this at some point because of his insatiable hunger for power, but as of 2022, he's already surpassed at least my expectations of what he was capable of. Although they haven't stuck around until the time that we're posting this, he has taken the powers of the Silver Surfer and even the Beyonder, giving him a whole new mantle of God Emperor Doom during the Secret Wars storyline. Just for scale, this gave Doctor Doom the ability to piece together broken pieces of the universe after the multiversal collapse. And that's a pretty crazy glow up if you ask me. And even if he doesn't hold quite that much power these days, having had that ability has changed the character forever, if you ask me. At number three is Darkseid. Originally introduced as a nearly unstoppable supervillain and one of the most powerful in the whole DC universe, Darkseid's powers have been dumbed down quite a bit since then. Although he appears the same, his immense power level just isn't the same these days as it always was. For example, his eye beams were originally meant to kill his targets in one hit, but these days, they don't by any means take out their targets in one hit. He used to be almost unbeatable, but it seems like heroes are making easier work of him than ever as of late. This is probably a result of him appearing more often in the comics, because if he'd kept his same unstoppable status, his his appearances would have to be regulated, or else our heroes would be out of commission in the blink of an eye. At number two is Anti-Monitor. Another case of a villain getting nerfed, Anti-Monitor's gotten it bad these days. If you thought Darkseid got taken down a notch, just think how much room there would be to do the same with Anti-Monitor, because he is, after all, the most powerful being in the DC multiverse. Just to get an idea of what I mean, back in the day, Anti-Monitor takes out multiple universes alone before he reaches ours, and then once he does, it takes a hell of a lot to take him down. In fact, it became one of the most notable moments in all of the DC comics when they did, because it was so difficult. But when he returns from his defeat and joins the Sinestro Corps, he just seems to be in a totally different echelon of power, a lesser one. 
to the point where the Justice League can take him out on their own these days. Which is just weird to see for fans who knew his power level back in the day. At number one is the Batman who laughs. Enough with the downgrades because this guy's change is a glow up if I've ever seen one. These days the Batman who laughs has gained so much power that he's known to be basically godlike and he finds these new powers in the place that he comes from, the dark multiverse. After finding a Dr. Manhattan powered Batman in the dark multiverse, the Batman who laughs gets his mind transferred into the body of that hero, acquiring the greater part of Dr. Manhattan's abilities, but with the sinister touch of his usual self as well. The only way that he's able to be taken down is when Wonder Woman finds a way to match his power level herself and defeats him despite his insane power boost. Number 10, Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn was created in the classic 90s Batman animated series where she was the Joker's main hench wench and girlfriend. She proved so popular that she was brought into the main comic book continuity where she was dressed pretty much the same as she was in the animated show, with a red and black jester costume. Over the years, both her look and personality have evolved as she has broken away from the Joker and become her own person, who is a bit more of an anti-hero at this point. Although her color scheme has remained the same, she now has a bit more of a wild look, wearing a red and black corset and leather jacket, letting her blonde hair with dyed pigtails flow free. It is a major difference, but there are other characters who have changed even more, which is why Harley is at the bottom of this list. Number 9. Pastepot Pete Originally, Pete used a glue gun to commit robberies while dressed in this rather strange green jumpsuit and purple beret. Pastepot Pete is really Peter Petruski, a scientist who developed an advanced adhesive that that made him very wealthy. However, he believed that a life of crime would be even more lucrative and began robbing banks and stealing missiles. He updated his costume a couple times, going for a more purple pouchy theme, and ended up changing his name to the Trapster after Spider-Man burst into hysterical laughter upon hearing the name Pastepot Pete. He made some minor updates to his look in the following years, but eventually settled on a yellow and brown outfit that he still wears in his most recent appearance. None of his looks are particularly menacing, but if I saw his first look side by side with his second look and was told that one was called Pastepot Pete and the other the Trapster, I would have no reason to think that they were the same villain other than both using a similar weapon. But at the same time, so do Captain Cold and Mr. Freeze. Number 8, Hawkeye. In his first appearance in Tales of Suspense number 57, Clint Barton was a carnival worker who performed incredible trick shots with arrows. When the audience was unimpressed with his performance and booed him off stage, he became jealous when he saw Iron Man show up to save the day when one of the rides went haywire, much to the crowd's delight. He thinks to himself, I'm the greatest marksman the world has ever known, and yet they ignore me. He decides that if he makes himself a few trick arrows, he will be just as respected as Iron Man, because a guy in a purple tunic and mask shooting arrows is just as impressive as a flying weaponized robot suit. He becomes a supervillain, going toe to toe with Iron Man. In the years since his first appearance, Hawkeye has gone from supervillain to superhero, and has had multiple identities and costumes. But in his most recent appearances, he has traded his more flashy, masked look for what is essentially just a black t-shirt with a purple arrow on it and some sunglasses. Without the context of the many years of stories between his first and most recent appearances, not only would you be confused as to his very different look, you'd also be surprised at how a supervillain is now one of the most frequent members of the Avengers. Number 7, The Riddler. Since his first appearance in Detective Comics number 140, The Riddler's gimmick has remained pretty much the same. He is hyper-intelligent and uses a elaborate traps, puzzles, and of course riddles to prove that he is smarter than the Batman. His look has remained pretty consistent across media, with him wearing a green spandex bodysuit covered in question marks for much of his career. Other times, when he's feeling dapper, he wears a green suit and bowler hat. This has been his look in almost every comic, and when he was first adapted for live action in the 1960s television show, Frank Gorshin's costume felt ripped right from the pages of the comics, with him alternating between the spandex and green suit looks. When Jim Carrey took over the role for Batman Forever, it was very much the same. Even when the character showed up in Gotham, he was pretty faithful to the character's original look. However, when Matt Reeves decided to take a more grounded approach to the character in the recent The Batman movie, he had Paul Dano's Riddler in an unrecognizable style. Gone were the spandex, and in its place was a green raincoat and a winter combat mask. You know, it's funny, when I watched this movie with my parents, they hadn't seen any of the marketing, and when Riddler showed up in the opening moments of the film, it wasn't until they saw his first riddle that they realized who he was. It's a bold new look for a bold new take on the character, but if Riddler shows up in a sequel, I wouldn't mind if he went just a 
touch more classic with his look now that he's an established villain. I mean, there's nothing really that heightened about a guy wearing a green suit jacket. Number six, Metallo. John Corbin was a very minor Superman villain who first appeared in Action Comics number 252 in 1959. In this story, he was a regular man who was in a car accident before being transformed by a scientist into a robot covered with foam latex which looked like flesh. He was given a kryptonite-powered heart and he soon clashed with the Man of Steel. In his first appearance, he's just a guy with a pencil mustache wearing a suit and there's nothing really notable about him. In fact, he dies in his first appearance. Once the New Earth continuity began, a revamped version of the character was introduced with probably his most iconic look. He was still a regular looking guy, but usually his skin would soon get torn off and he would be seen as a menacing metal skeleton, not unlike the Terminator. In more recent appearances, he's in a more bulky mech suit with glowing green components. He is quite an underrated villain, but if you saw the current version or the skeleton version next to the original guy in a suit version, you'd have no reason to suspect all three were the same character. Number five, Icarus. If we compare Icarus's first First appearance to his latest appearance in the comics, you'll definitely see a pretty big transformation if we're just going with that first appearance. Icarus makes his first appearance in issue number one of The Eternals, and while his golden locks may stay the same, his outfit has developed a lot more since what we see him in in that first issue. We see him both disguised in civilian clothes and basically potentially wearing a little loincloth and booties if he's the man flying across the panel that I'm thinking of. I'm pretty sure that's him. That guy also has golden locks and a similar look to Icarus, or at least the attire that he is wearing has a similar look. It's pretty limited though. Icarus in modern comics, whether we're talking about Kieran Gillen's latest and greatest Eternal series or the AXE Judgment Day event, wears a lot more clothes now. Although I will admit on that first issue of Eternals, there is a little picture of him in his outfit. So sure, but I'm more talking about what happens in the issue. <laughs> his civilian disguise, the sunglasses, the hat. More recently as well, his adaptation in the Marvel Cinematic Universe has him looking quite different additionally, where he was played by Richard Richard Madden, showcasing him as a brunette instead of the more literal golden locked golden boy. That iteration of the character also wore more blue and gold than his comic book counterpart, who lately is often draped in blue and red colors. That's more Icarus in the comics. I guess they had to get the gold in there somewhere, you know what I mean? Number four, The Flash. The Flash is not even the same person as he was originally. He isn't even from the same Earth either. Initially, Jay Garrick was The Flash, appearing back in Flash Comics issue number one. Later on, a new Flash would be introduced to us, and we'd learn that the original Flash, Jay Garrick, actually existed on another world, known as Earth 2. Barry Allen's Flash would first appear back in the 1950s in Showcase issue number 4, and would continue to be a recurring mainstay in the comics throughout his history, up until today, where Barry is still around even now, and for many people he's still the Flash. Today, however, the more prominent Flash I would say, currently in comics, is Barry's nephew, Wally West. That's my Flash, but you know, I respect people that prefer Barry. Wally West, as well, is a completely different person and also happens to look totally different in terms of his outfit in comparison to the original Flash, Jay Garrick. All in all, The Flash has come a long way throughout the character's history, and while these are just the three main Flashes, the Flash family would also grow exponentially over time. So while they all might not be known as The Flash, there are also just tons of speedsters who are related to The Flashes running around. In fact, we should probably do a Flash family attempting to explain video or a Speed Force attempting to explain video then, in and of itself itself, that concept. Very interesting. Number three, the Wasp. You might not recognize Jana Van Dyne anymore because I feel like, well, it's been a minute since we've actually seen her as a hero in the comics. Correct me if I am wrong because I really want to be wrong on this as, you know, I, I haven't read everything, but I feel like Janet has been missing for quite a while in the comics, unless I'm wrong, which is kind of surprising considering she was originally one of the mainstays on the Avengers. I've seen her appear as a friend to Jen and She-Hulk in her civilian form when she lent Jen an apartment, and I know she was dating Iron Man kind of recently, but that's about all I can think of when it comes to Wasp. And I mean, she's not dating Iron Man now because he was with Hellcat, I think, last I checked. What is Iron Man's dating history? <laughs> So strange. Fortunately, Jan is getting her own solo series. Well, she's gonna share it, but you know, the Wasp is getting their own solo series. Possibly the very first Wasp solo series ever as of 2023, which seems crazy to me. I hope I'm wrong on that one. This series will be shared with Nadia Van Dyne, who is also currently known as the Wasp in the comics. Janet first appeared in issue number 44 of Tales to Astonish alongside Ant-Man, and since then has had quite the evolution when it comes to her look, ditching the Ant-Man coordinated 
red for a bright yellow and black suit. Nadia also is technically a totally new character who took up the mantle, so totally different person. Despite her full name, she is the daughter of Hank Pym from his first marriage, who grew up in prison in Russia. After escaping and coming to America, she learned that her father was dead, but Janet still lived. Bonding with her stepmother, Nadia was inspired to take up her last name instead, which she did with Jan's blessing. Also becoming known as a hero, the Unstoppable Wasp. Which also obviously Janet was like, yeah, you can be the Wasp, I'm cool with it. Number 2. Captain Britain Or more specifically, Betsy Braddock Whether we're looking at things from the point of view as the hero mantle of Captain Britain, or looking at it from the character viewpoint of Betsy Braddock, either way, Betsy is looking pretty different now. For a good amount of time in the comics, Betsy was known for looking just like Quanin, because well, uh, she was kind of in Quanin's body, or they were kind of fused together at one point. Fortunately, she has now been restored to her own body, freeing Quanin and allowing Quanin to take up the Psylocke mantle. Betsy then went on to become the new Captain Britain in her brother Brian Braddock's place after he was ensorcelled by Morgan Le Fay, becoming her new Dark Knight. It was up to Betsy at that point to take Brian's amulet and become the new Captain Britain until Brian could be saved. Betsy has been shattered and managed to return and is still known as Captain Britain Kuro. Even though Brian also got free, but then Brian was like, you take it, I'm good, I'm gonna do other stuff. You don't have a lot going on right now, Betsy, so take a thing and then make it your own thing. I like it. Number 1. Captain Kate Even Kitty Pride's name has shifted somewhat. She's been known by a few different names in the comics, Shadow Cat, Sprite, Kitty Pride. Now however, she prefers if you just call her Kate. Captain Kate is the Red Queen of the Hellfire Trading Company, and typically dresses in red as such. But not only that, she also typically dresses kind of piratey now. I personally love it. This is because Kate is now also the leader of the Marauders, who have reclaimed this one villainous name and are basically a pirate crew who sailed the seas, bringing those mutants to Krakoa who want to be there, but who for one reason or another can't get there. They also help deliver and intercept shipments of goods as necessary. So the whole look really fits with what Kate is up to currently in the comics, but it is very different from her original or even her past looks. Kate before, Kate now. Although I will say that original outfit that she's wearing with like the red vest and like the stripy shirt, I was like, is there already like pirate vibes that, that were kind of carried over here? I don't know. Number 10, Super Scrawl. Clurt might be recognizable when it comes to his character design, which admittedly has not changed that much over the years. But when it comes to his alignment, you might be somewhat surprised to learn where he is now, from where he started. Super Skrull Clurt made his first appearance in Fantastic Four issue 18. Once again, the Skrulls attempted to invade Earth and planned on defeating the FF, this time with their secret weapon the Super Skrull, who seemed to possess all of the Fantastic Four's powers. Unfortunately, Mr. Fantastic and the team realized that these powers were likely not Super Skrull's own, and suspected, in fact, that they were delivered to him from the Skrull homeworld. They used a device to jam the signal that was giving Clurt his powers, defeating him. Currently in the comics, Clurt serves Emperor Hulkling, and was for a time one of his trusted advisors. Clurt, however, was also the one who killed Hulkling's foster mother. Recently in Empire Aftermath, Clurt felt so awful about his past that he actually offered his life to the Emperor. Hulkling refused to accept it though, instead preferring to make Clurt work in the area of diplomacy so that he might make amends for all the lives that he had taken in times of war. He was like, no. Instead, you gotta save lives, and hopefully that'll make up for it. You can't just die on me, Clurt. Number 9. Hell's Bells Hell's Bells was a group of villains who were all female mutants. The team was originally assembled by Cyber, who trained all of its members and consisted of Shrew, Briquette, Flame, Tremolo, and Vague. When Shrew betrayed them by testifying against them in order to get immunity for herself, the Hell's Bells banded together in an attempt to get revenge on her for betraying them. Eventually, they would be successfully taken into custody by X-Factor. Following the events of M-Day and Decimation, all team members save Briquette found themselves completely depowered. 
They still have operated as criminals in the comics, appearing in the Children of Adam series most recently, but they were a lot less scary because they had to rely on equipment and gadgets in place of, you know, their own powers. Even without their powers, the team mainly stuck together though, minus Briquette and obviously Shrew. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want even more lists about Marvel villains you might not recognize or something in that realm, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Silver Samurai. While well, Silver Samurai looks much the same in the comics as he always has, not every iteration of him has been mm, so recognizable. We've seen him turn up here and there on Krakoa recently, he seems to enjoy watching and participating in the friendly single combat matches in the quarry, and in modern comics, he's recognizable. But how about in modern film? Well, Silver Samurai might not be a main character in Fox's mutant universe, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. He actually made an appearance in the 2013 film The Wolverine. But although here he also seemingly looked the same, when it came to his armor at least, he couldn't be further from his comic book counterpart in actuality. That's because Silver Samurai here was an adamantium robot whom Wolverine had to battle against. Yeah. Yeah, they made Kenny Yokio Harada robot armor. He was at least piloted by Ikiro Yoshida, who was obviously that film's version of Ken's own father in the comics. So, at least there was a little bit of a thing, but still, he wasn't even a person. He was just robot armor. Like, rude. <laughs> Ken is a whole person, okay? It's not just armor. Number seven, forearm. Forearm is Michael McCain. Originally, Michael was part of Strife's Mutant Liberation Front. He was one of the founding members, but would end up defeated by those that fought against him. Despite generally being on the side of the villains, Forearm was also welcomed onto the mutant island nation of Krakoa, where he could have a fresh start for himself. He accepted the offer and would end up joining S.W.O.R.D. and being seen as a member of Magic's Dark Riders, who I think should get their own book. However, on Krakoa, he looks a bit different from his initial appearance, where he decidedly was showing a lot more Forearm and had much less shirt. Forearm's mutant power is that he has four arms. Get it? Get it? his forearms. And now he wears shirts. Good for you, forearm. Good for you. Although you can also not wear a shirt. You can, you can not wear a shirt. If you don't want to wear a shirt, like, I'm not going to pressure anyone to wear shirts if they don't want to, or vice versa. I'm not going to pressure anyone to, like, not wear a shirt if they're like, I like my shirt. Let me keep my shirt. But I do like his new design as well. His new outfit is pretty cool. Number six, Thanos. Thanos might look very similar to his initial appearance in the comics, and also looks quite similar on the big screen, but he's seen a pretty big change when it comes to mm, what he's up to recently. In the comics, that is. In the MCU, he's mainly dead and gone, but there is a chance perhaps that he could return? Who knows? Not only have we now met Star Fox or Eros in the MCU, but in the comics, Thanos has become the new Prime Eternal, and as such, their new leader. That's right, this guy just went from being the baddest supervillain around to leader of a superhero team. Although we'll have to see where the Eternals alignment is in the comics following the events of Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals War, because that's probably going to be crazy. Also, I don't even know what the Eternals is really doing in that mix, but I'm here for it. I'm here to check that out. And at number five, we have Gambit. Back in 1990, when the character was introduced, he didn't strike me as much of a pretty boy as he seems to be portrayed today. But now, his charm has become actual part of his power set known as Hypnotic Charm. Now, with this new storyline being dropped later this month, I can't confirm what I don't know about the official 2022 version of the character, but in recent years, Gambit has changed quite a bit, at least in certain portrayals. Partly with his newer Hypnotic Charm power, but also with his abilities he acquired during his time as the Horseman of Death or Apocalypse. During this time, he gains a set of newer, darker abilities that usually aim to kill, and even further, after blinding himself with an exploding card, Gambit learns how to see the future somehow, which is a big deal for a character that has always otherwise just been concerned strictly with kinetic energy and things of the like. And although these days he has renounced the title of Horseman of Death, he still might have the ability to disintegrate his targets through molecular acceleration. In his new self-titled series, however, we'll see him paired up with a child version of Storm, which will tell the story of how Gambit came to be an X-Man. So maybe 
maybe the character will get back to something closer to his original portrayal, whether we want that or not, but we'll see. At number four is Iceman, another character that is being endowed with a whole new range to his power set. Iceman these days appears to have the ability to conjure up ice beasts on command and freeze his targets on a molecular level. Some argue that the level that Bobby Drake has brought his powers to at this point has given him status as an Omega Mutant, which is a far cry from the days he was riding ice slides and throwing snowballs. Still having these ice slide abilities at his disposal, Iceman seems to favor his god level powers these days and for good reason. I just didn't expect the young Robert Drake from the old X-Men cartoons to have come so far as to be able to create living beings from scratch, but crazier things have happened in the last few years. At number three we have Magneto, who seems to have reached a new level of power these days, with his magnetokinesis now being applied to the whole electromagnetic spectrum, he gains a whole new set of abilities. As of late, Magneto has been showing off his gravity defying powers, radiation absorption, and even light manipulation, allowing him to turn himself and others invisible. So yeah, if you didn't think that having total control over all the metals in the universe was enough, Magneto is now these days able to control light. So there's that. I mean, to an extent. At one point, he even makes Dazzler punch herself in the face with her own light-based powers, which is pretty OP if you ask me, but it's still the old Magneto we've always known somewhere in there. He looks roughly the same. He's just developed quite a bit since the old days and we're excited to see where he goes from this year onward. At number two, we have Jubilee. Jubilee has always typically been known as a bit of a pushover, having a pretty passive power set under her belt. She was able to shoot fireworks on command and that was sort of it. She was always a fun person and was great at distracting enemies, but in terms of sheer power, she wasn't gonna land high on a list if she was ranked among her peers. But in the last couple of years, this character has undergone a total transformation and what turns out to be known as Lumikinetic Explosive Light Blasting is a power that could be tapped more than just creating small bursts of fireworks on command. These days, Jubilee is able to create literal explosions, sometimes even considered to be nuclear level. Not only this, but over the last couple of years, she has also spent a good stint as a vampire, which just makes the character even more different from what we've always been used to leading into 2022. At number one, we have Batman from Dark Knights of Steel. In this new limited series that is being released as we speak, if you're watching this in 2022 when it was posted, Batman is being given a total medieval makeover. Along with other DC characters, Batman navigates a medieval landscape of dragons and ancient magic, donning not only a suit of armor, but a sword as well, which really takes the concept of the Dark Knight to more of a literal degree than I think any of us were ever expecting. But honestly, it works for me. These days, Batman has become a character, and a franchise for that matter, that is being openly explored through various different lenses in the comics and in the movies. And people seem to be openly inviting more and more off the wall portrayals of the character no matter how different they appear from the original. And in the Dark Knights of Steel we're seeing yet another example of this where Batman isn't even being set in the same time period anymore. But even though he may be somewhat unrecognizable from let's say the Tom King series, I feel like this has become something that fans of Batman have gotten used to over the years. At number 10 is Despero. Although Despero has always been totally jacked, he was originally known as more of a threat to the Justice Justice League through mind manipulation. During the Silver Age, he would only typically use his telepathic powers before anything else, but these days, it's a different story. Although these changes did start to take place way back in the 80s, the character has come a long way since the days when he would sit on his throne and twiddle his fingers most of the time. Now, he seems to do a lot of the grunt work himself, even looking larger in size these days than ever before. And even outside of the comics, Despero's appearance in the Arrowverse offers a totally different look in to the villain. He takes on a human form for much of the time who is, well, let's just say he's not as big as Despero, nor does he have much musculature to him, no offense to that actor. Nor does he have a third eye or anything that a comic book fan would expect. And when he's in proper form, he just seems a lot less demonic and cunning, more like Hellboy's very serious detective older brother or something like that. At number nine, we have Anton Arcane. The penultimate villain to Swamp Thing, Anton Arcane has always been a threat as one of the most prolific evil scientists in all of DC. But when Swamp Thing finally kills 
kills Anton during one of their many confrontations back in 2016, I think, the villain goes to hell and basically becomes a demon. Having been a pretty tame foe for most of the Swamp Thing comics, Anton Arcane's physical changes have made him almost unrecognizable now that he's a demon. And what's worse is that he continues to bother Swamp Thing and his niece Abigail but now with the added demonic powers in mind. So he's changed quite a bit, both in looks and power set. At number eight, we have Psycho Pirate. The way that this villain has changed since the Infinite Crisis event is unmatched. Although he looks relatively the same, he's gained such a power boost that he now works with the likes of Darkseid and Alexander Luther. After surviving the crisis, he comes out on top, getting his hands on what's known as the Medusa Mask. And what this helps him do is basically summon beings from the old multiverse, which, as you can imagine, is a very powerful ability, especially directly following the event itself. And even though he's been killed by Black Adam during the events of Blackest Night, Psycho Pirate's corpse is brought back to life as a Black Lantern. And as you can imagine, this gives him a whole new look and increases his power level. He loses the Medusa mask in this ghoulish form, but even without it, he appears totally different than how we're used to seeing him. At number 7, we have Doomsday. The primary change with Doomsday isn't something that's been gained, but something that's been lost. A very notable power of his, actually, and that is his hyper adaptability. Ability. In fact, I would even argue that this was his main power. And what it meant was he could learn from past losses in battle and change his physiology to prevent himself from being killed in the same way twice. I don't know why this has been dropped because aside from it being the defining characteristic of Doomsday, it was just a really fun ability to watch because it made every encounter with the villain a new challenge for the heroes, which would ultimately make for an exciting read. But for whatever reason, Reason, this power has basically been left in the dust, making Doomsday that much less unique from any other bruiser type villain, at least in my opinion. At number six, we have Dr. Octopus. Something that the less avid readers may not know about this villain is that he's been going back and forth between heroism and villainy for some time now. And not only that, Otto Octavius has recently taken on the mantle of Spider-Man, donning the superior Spider-Man armor outfitted with the mechanical arms and everything. He's also been taken over by Venom recently, as well as the Carnage symbiote. Although he's known to be back to his evil ways and his classic suit in 2022, there is no telling if he'll jump back into the Spidey suit once more. He's already gone back and forth a number of times, even in the last few years, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did it again. Number five, Rhino. Rhino was given a completely new look for his appearance in the second Amazing Spider-Man Spider-Man film. Honestly, Rhino is a hard villain to do in live action, I feel like, so I'm not surprised with the direction that they went with, but also, what a weird direction to go in for that character, considering what they're actually supposed to be like in the comics. In the comics, Rhino is Alexei Sistovich, who is genetically altered and then bonded to a suit of armor that increases his strength and durability. Basically, he's given, like, a mechanical Rhino skin but like the skin. The armor was modeled after a rhinoceros as they are known in nature for being relentless when it comes to their assault and extremely hard to defeat due to their tough hide. Rhino, however, has never been known for being very smart, which makes him fairly easy to defeat usually, which seems to be the same idea when it came to his cinematic counterpart. However, the whole design for this character was definitely different than the comic book counterpart, whose armor was much less neck-like or robotic and is more like just the tough hide of a rhino. Really, he kind of just looks like a guy in a rhino suit in the comics. Also, Alexi is just super jacked in the comics, and his cinematic counterpart with didn't seem so Jack. He was just like a guy in a suit. Of course, Alexi does get a lot of his jackedness as well from his whole rhino thing, but he also, I think, was jacked still to begin with. I'm pretty sure. He's just more jacked. Number four, Legion. Legion has a new look in X-Men Onslaught Revelation. This one-shot is kind of like the bookend for the Way of X limited series, if you were checking that out. Which I personally haven't read all of, but I will say the parts of it that I have read have been strictly excellent, so I would recommend Way of X to anyone that's interested. If you like the idea of pondering the why in life and beliefs, and you enjoy philosophical prose, this is really a great series for you. In Onslaught Revelation, Nightcrawler, Legion, Pixie, 
and Dust come together to try and defeat the resurrected Onslaught, who has been slowly returning with each resurrection, residing as pieces in the minds of all mutants. In order to help in the fight against Onslaught, Legion makes his mind a safe space for all mutants to come through, in essence also fully connecting with Krakoa and kind of becoming a sort of hive mind if necessary. As such, he gets a redesign, though he still gets to keep his, the wild shape of his hair that we've all come to recognize so well and that I've really come to love. Legion moving forward after the defeat of Onslaught will also keep this look as he becomes the newly created religion's church. That's right, Legion is the church. He's the building. In essence, people can come into his mind to worship, find community, and seek sanctuary. It's like a nice safe space for people to come and just like be and feel good. It's awesome. I love that Legion is the church. I just think that's great. Number three, Donald Blake. Donald Blake ended up becoming a villain recently in the comics, which is a pretty big change for a guy who was once also the mighty hero Thor. Donald Blake used to be Thor's human form, but in reality was kind of his own person, or he kind of ended up becoming his own person. He was created by Odin to be a human host for Thor, but after Thor died at the hands of the serpent, Blake became separated from Thor and became his own separate entity. Eventually, he would end up going to the Enchantress for help, only for her to use him to make her own villainous creature referred to as the Keep. Basically, she, she killed Donald Blake and then used his blood to make the Keep, and we haven't seen the Keep in a while, but I'm sure he's out there somewhere. After Amora and the Keep were defeated by Thor, Blake was laid to rest, living on as a disembodied head in a dream world that was crafted for him. Well, living on as a person in the dream world, but he was just a disembodied head. But he was asleep, so he was dreaming. Eventually, though, Blake came to realize that this world wasn't real, and awoke from his dream, seeking revenge on all Thors across the multiverse for what had happened to him. And don't worry, he, he wasn't just a head then, he, he, got a, he had a body then. He would end up being defeated by 616 Thor in the end, and then made into the God of Lies, as per Thor's brother Loki's suggestion. Thor was like, what do we do with this guy? We shouldn't kill this guy. He's Donald Blake. Loki's like, nah, let's make him the God of Lies. Seems to fit, considering everything Donald Blake has been through. Penultimately, into number two, Roy Harper. When Roy Harper became a Black Lantern, I honestly felt like it was the biggest changing design for any character in the Black Lantern core, especially since it happened recently in Infinite Frontier, and he's alive. Following the events of Death Metal, a number of heroes and villains were brought back to life in the Infinite Frontier era. Among them included Jade and Arsenal, with the latter returning with all new powers. After being tracked down by the multiversal bounty hunter Extract, who was previously Green Arrow's powerless side Kick, punched them with a giant black energy blast, revealing that he'd taken on the powers of a Black Lantern. However, Black Lanterns are usually reanimated from the dead by their ring, while Harper is very much alive. While trying to sort all this out, Roy tries talking to the ring to get some answers, which ends up revealing that his daughter Leanne is still alive. Unfortunately, when he asks the ring to show him where she is, instead ends up saying where Darkseid is, and he's transformed into a monster. And, and changes his symbol changes to like an Omega symbol like dark side and then he flies off and finally in a number one swamp thing the new infinite frontier version of swamp thing is certainly something else and it's really interesting. Known as Levi Kamei, after visiting his home and family in India, Levi grew connected to the green, becoming the new Swamp Thing. He's still learning to grasp his power and what it means to be the avatar of the green but holy shit, his appearance is one of the most nightmarish Swamp Things I've seen. He's like the Hellspawn version of Swamp Thing. Like Black Lantern Swamp Thing, but still green. Yeah, and like kind of like that. Just like, Jesus Christ. If I hadn't been told that this was Swamp Thing, I would actually kind of have no idea. I would think that it's something that like Swamp Thing spawned or like a, a hell version of Swamp Thing. Number 10, Bishop. As some of you pointed out in the comments on the part 1 of this list, a lot of 90s characters, especially 90s X-Men, have completely different looks in the modern day when compared with their 90s appearances. Lucas Bishop is definitely one such character. Although he still has his M tattoo over his eye and a few details in his costume that pay homage to his original look, Bishop has definitely seen some changes. Some of which might be so great that fans may not at first recognize him. While he 
still often is seen with his XSC guns and even still sports a red bandana, Bishop is now a member of the Marauders. Gone are the days of those 90s X-Men colors, and modern day Bishop dresses mainly in reds and blacks, in homage as well to his role as the Hellfire Trading Company's Red Bishop. Also, I love that Bishop is the Red Bishop because he's a bishop and his name's Bishop. It's crazy. Number nine, Crystal. Crystal's initial appearance had her recognizable mainly by her ginger or strawberry blonde hair and a simple white dress. I personally always thought of Crystal as being ginger, but then I see so many different versions of her where she has like maybe blonde hair. So I don't know, but I've always thought of her as a ginger. She is known for being the younger sister of Medusa, who is the inhuman queen and true love of Black Bolt. Crystal has had a few different looks, but generally she has longer ginger hair and is either in a yellow suit or a Fantastic Four suit when she was, you know, on that team. She has been known for dating Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, was once married to Quicksilver and had a daughter with him, and she was even for a time married to Ronan the Accuser. Yeah, it's been an interesting dating history, I feel like, for Crystal. All in all, Crystal has had a sort of wild life. And while her costume has changed gradually, comparing her short blonde haired self in her yellow and black diamond suit to her first appearance with long ginger like hair in her white dress, looks like a dress to me, and you might not know it's Crystal at first glance. And friends, if you want even more lists where we talk about all the glow ups in comics and I guess some of the glow downs, if that's a thing, be sure to let us know that you love this list by giving it a thumbs up. Number eight, Pyro. Pyro might be sporting a very similar suit when it comes to how he looked in his first appearance, but he also now has a skull tattoo, a full face skull tattoo. And honestly, I have come to love it. Not only that, but this version of Pyro was also originally known as a villain, and like many on the island nation of Krakoa, has been given a new lease on life where he no longer needs to be a villain. Instead, recently, Pyro has exclusively acted as a hero fighting alongside his shipmates and teammates, the Marauders. During his time with the Marauders team, St. John Allardyce ended up taking refuge with his fellow teammates in a tattoo parlor. A few of them decided to get tats while they were there, Pyro included. He decided to get a full face tattoo, getting a black skull tattooed over top his face. And I gotta say, it's just been growing on me more and more every time I read Marauders. At first, after he got this tat, I was expecting, like so many other Krakoans, that Pyro would end up dying and then being resurrected, erasing the tattoo from his face. After all, who needs tattoo removal when you have resurrection protocols and mutants dying and returning is no longer really a big deal at all. Although I'm sure the healing gardens could remove Pyro's tattoo almost as easily. Still, he hasn't gotten it removed or died and been brought back without it yet, so while you might wonder who that is with the skull face tattoo, it seems that it's becoming part of Pyro's modern day look quite seamlessly. So maybe in 10 years from now, we'll be like, oh yeah, it's Pyro, because the the skull face tattoo. Maybe he'll still have it. Number seven, Flash Thompson, or as he's currently known, Agent Anti Venom. Still, it's pretty wild to think that Flash Thompson, aka Eugene Thompson, started out as Peter Parker's bully back in the day. Flash has come a long way from being an antagonist to a friend of Peter's to a full on war hero and later superhero. He's battled alcoholism, became an amputee, and even traveled into space where he fought alongside the Guardians of the Galaxy. If you only knew Flash from his first appearance, or vice versa, you only knew him from modern day comics, you'd probably be shocked to see just how different the character is, how far he has come, and how much he has grown and evolved. He even became such a popular character among fans that he got to join the Resurrection Club, being returned to life recently after dying during the fight against Red Goblin. And at 6, Wally West. Wally's lightning color has shifted based on various circumstances before. After escaping the Speed Force, his energy shifted from yellow to white due to his connection to the Speed Force growing stronger. And Wally's lightning later evolved to an indigo blue cosmic energy and this was most notable when he united with the Mobius chair. Learning his children were inhabitants of a new dark multiverse earth created by his own fears of losing them, an earth that Tempest Fugonaut was now tasking him with destroying. Wally spent one last day with his kids, spending a nice dinner with them and giving them one 
last kiss before deciding to make his move, knowing what needed to be done. So he forced Tempest to promise him to get his kids to the Earth once he acted, leading Wally to sit on the Mobius chair and obtain its knowledge and power. The new godlike Wally just watched stuff and then just kind of destroyed everything. <laughs> but he also realized that the chair was now infused with the power of Dr. Manhattan and he could just do more than just sit and watch. Yeah, an omniscient flash? And that's that that's pretty traumatic. Halfway through in number five, Green Arrow. Ha <laughs> ha, you knew this was gonna happen. The Arrowverse crossover event Crisis on Infinite Earths had been in the process of setup for a while, with the previous Elseworlds crossover just being one big commercial for it, basically. And the seasons leading up to it revolving mostly around what could happen in Crisis. One of these issues was the death of Oliver Queen, which shockingly was carried out in the first part of the crossover. After bringing Oliver back to life at the Lazarus Pit on Earth 19, John Diggle, his daughter from the future Mia, and Constantine all traveled to Purgatory to retrieve his soul. But when he was about to go back with them, Jim Corrigan arrives with a way for Oliver to save everyone. This turns Oliver into the Spectre, basically the most powerful being in the multiverse, giving him the powers of a god, allowing Oliver to reboot the universe with the help of the Paragons, and also stopping the Anti-Monitor from securing the destruction of all Earths. He also ended up corrupting the Speed Force by empowering Barry, which resulted in the Speed Force dying for a time, um, which is a whole other can of worms I won't discuss. But needless to say, you wouldn't recognize this version of Green Arrow, especially since he's dead and you can't really see him. In it for Black Lightning. In Dark Knights of Steel, Superman finds his way to a medieval Earth where familiar DC favorites are recast in the Middle Ages. Batman is a young prince and John Constantine is an oracle. But perhaps the most unique transformation is that of Black Lightning, who now is a king, pursuing a mysterious agenda against Superman and his family. The character has not been regularly seen in the comics for some time, but returns in Dark Knights of Steel, which has got to be my personal favorite Earth so far, because medieval Cheese King, you get it. This time, Supes' parents actually made its Earth along with him, and in the Kingdom of Storms, Kal-El's birth has triggered horrifying visions in a young John Constantine. As Constantine lays writhing on the ground, his mind is overwhelmed, and he's dictating his visions to the royal scribe. The king arrives, and readers see that it's Black Lightning. He's concerned over Constantine's visions, and tells the scribe to write down everything the boy says. As Constantine comes out of his trance, he tells Black Lightning that the end is near. This is a pretty damn badass version of Black Black Lightning, similar to Black Panther in a way, since now Jefferson is rightfully a king. Respect. Getting close to the end in number three, Wonder Woman. The Dark Knight's death metal story wrapped up early 2021 with issue number seven. And in that issue, and the issue before, we see Wonder Woman at her most powerful, in a godlike form that's even more powerful than a god. As the comic puts it, quote, she has been a god before, but at this moment she's more. At this point, she has ascended past godhood and can see all of time and all realities, okay? She sees like every Earth's timeline, and she faces off against the Batman who laughs in his most powerful form as well. This fight is so intense that they hit each other through time itself. Diana here is charged with anti-crisis energy, a connective force that links all history and all lives as one story. Then she moves on to become one of the hands that created the multiverse going forward, with no walls and greater possibilities. She aids in creating the future state story we see in the next issues, and what was seemingly the centerpiece of DC 2021. So Wonder Woman becoming a god and remaking the universe, while very Oliver Queen as Spectre, still a pretty damn dramatic change. Penultimately, in the number two, Dreamer. Nia Nal, also known by her code name Dreamer, is a fictional superhero from the Arrowverse television series Supergirl, portrayed by Nicole Maines. The character is based on and is depicted as an ancestor of the DC Comics character Nora Nal, also known as Dream Girl. She debuts in the fourth season of the series, and Nia Nal is the first transgender superhero on television. In March 2021, it was announced that Nia Nal would feature and make her comic debut in a story written by Maines to be published in a Pride-themed comic book anthology on June 8th, 2021. Mostly, you won't recognize her because she was a character really created by the show, even if she was intended to be a present version of Dream Girl. Nia Nal's powers include precognition and astral projection. On July 21st, 2018, trans activist and actress Nicole Maines was announced in the role at the show's San Diego Comic-Con panel. It was also confirmed that Nia would become the superhero Dreamer and that she is an ancestor of the Legion of Superheroes member Nora Nal. Maines described Dreamer as having this ferocious drive to protect people and to fight against discrimination and hatred. She's the superhero we need right now. The character is the first transgender superhero on television, and honestly, I think that it was worth it for this list. And finally, in a number one, Batman. Batman and Dark Knights of Steel, a new limited series from DC featuring your favorite heroes and villains as medieval knights, has made a load of changes to the character in this world. One of the biggest changes being to Batman. Bruce is the knight assigned to protect the king and queen of House L, as well as their son Cal, like how Link was assigned to protect Zelda in the story of Breath of the Wild. However, he seems to 
be more than just a mere man, able to withstand a banshee crime, in this case being Black Canary's crime. When it really should have killed him, he only bled from his ears. Even he was confused and worried that he had magic inside him, so he told Jor-El, who came to Earth along with his wife and son before Krypton exploded, that he should be banished for their sake. And that's when, spoiler alert for the first issue, it's revealed that Bruce is really the result of an affair between Jor-El and Martha. So Batman is now part Kryptonian. Number 10, Storm. Storm has had many different looks throughout the years, and depending on which era of Storm you are most familiar with, you might not recognize her right away when it comes to her appearances in modern day comics. When I think of Storm, one of the most iconic looks I think of is her very different 80s punk rocker look, where she's sporting a bright white mohawk. For me, this look is still one of the first ones that I think of even today. Even if you go back to her first appearance, she looks pretty different in comparison even to the 80s look. The cool thing about the modern day Storm look is that it seems to sort of incorporate all of these looks that have come before while also being quite unique. It's an homage to the past while not discounting the very real possibility of a grander future. That's actually what I like when it comes to a lot of the X-Men's updated looks. It's all about acknowledging the past while also using said past to fuel and motivate the future. Storm's initial appearance, her 80s look, and of course, the now. Number 9, Venom. You wouldn't recognize Venom today compared to his 90s appearance either. For one, Venom initially appeared as a villain and therefore not only looked different, but also acted quite differently. And now if we're talking about hosts that we associate with Venom, they're also pretty different in terms of their appearance. Currently, the Venom symbiote is teamed up with Eddie Brock's son, Dylan Brock. Oh yeah, if you've been out of comics for a while, Eddie Brock also has a son now. Dylan is actually Anne and Eddie's son, with a, a little mix in of Venom as well, who was also there when he was conceived. And if we're talking about Venom in terms of Eddie Brock, you might not recognize him either. He's aged considerably as a result of him becoming the new King in Black following that King in Black event where Null was defeated and Eddie took his place. That was Venom and Eddie Brock then, and that is who Venom is attached to now, and what Eddie looks like now. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about all of the changes in comics, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Echo. Echo is Maya Lopez. When she first appeared, she was a villain who didn't even know that she was a villain in the story. She ended up fighting against Daredevil after being misled and made to believe that he was the one responsible for killing her father. She wasn't really a villain though, she was just like a misguided person. Echo's really, I think, always been a hero deep down. When we first see her, she wears bandages on her arms, possibly an allusion to her one woman dance show, which is actually based on her life, which was all about how she felt like an Echo. Also, yes, there are many things that Echo is skilled at because her power is like Taskmaster's. She can acquire a physical skill simply by watching it. So she's not just an amazing fighter and martial artist, but she's also a great dancer too. Echo currently in the comics has shown up in the Avengers. She is now the new Phoenix in the comics having won the opportunity and burden of being bonded with the Phoenix Force during the Phoenix Tournament. In fact, Maya in the tournament didn't actually win, but instead was chosen because she had lost the most. The Phoenix Force was looking for a fallen champion apparently, not a big time winner. Echo as the Phoenix looks quite different than her initial appearance, no? I think it's like the Phoenix Flames for me. She still has those bandages though, and she's still got her face paint with her hand. Number 7, Iceman. When Iceman originally came on the scene, he had a very different look. If we go back to his first appearance in X-Men issue number 1, he was actually more like a snowman than an Iceman. Iceman in his early days wasn't quite as frozen solid and was more like an anthropomorphic but faceless snowman in battle. He didn't wear a trademark X-Men uniform, but he did put on his little black booties, which were kind of like, I guess, X-Men trademark uniform booties because they're black and yellow and that's there was a lot of black and yellow coloring with those original uniforms. This meant that Iceman was always the one who had to help Angel get dressed as Warren had to deal with his wings, both unbinding them and then of course fitting them through his uniform holes, I imagine. We'd later learn in Marvel's Voices Pride from 2021 that Bobby was actually pretty happy to help as he had a bit of a crush on Warren back in the day. Iceman since then has had a major glow up and appears to look like an ice prince in modern day comics. He even has cool spiky pauldrons. Spiky pauldrons. He's also had a glow up in terms of his powers too. 
Woo! Number 6 Cable In recent years, Cable has had a completely new look considering that his old version died and was replaced with his younger version. Of course, his older version has since returned, but there was a good amount of time there in the comics when you might have been confused as to just who exactly you were reading about. Is Kid Cable meant to be Nathan's son, you might have thought, or is he some like de-aged version of Nathan Summers? Well, the latter is the correct assumption if you made it. Young Cable actually hunted his older self down, in essence completing his time loop. But of course, the old man still existed out there and if you went to the right point and place in time, he would still be living earlier portions of his life. As such, we were able to bring old man Cable back in the comics and young Cable actually realized that he would also have to leave and let the old man basically take over, as while well, he thought he knew it all, young and all, that's what young people usually think. They think they know it all. It turns out he still has lots to learn. Honestly though, I love both versions of Cable and I wish that old Cable could team up with his younger self on more occasions. I want like a Kid Cable and Old Man Cable team up comic. <laughs> Number 5 Speedball Or as he was known for a good amount of time in the comics, Penance Robert Baldwin initially got his powers after a lab experiment went awry. After being exposed to extra dimensional radiation, Robbie found that when he was the target of a certain amount of force, his body would transform. Instead of him being harmed from said blow, he would produce a protective barrier, causing him to become basically like a human bouncy ball. He could use this energy to then shield others, blast opponents, or to even halt speeding projectiles in midair. Speedball would later join the new warriors. However, later on, he would be part of an incident at the center of the first civil war, where 612 civilians were killed, including 60 children. This would prompt him to change in appearance and in mindset, becoming Penance, a spiky armored version of the character who had internal spikes in his suit to remind him of all the victims lost as he felt personally responsible for their deaths. Speedball has since returned to his original appearance, but it has taken him time to recover both physically and mentally from his time as Penance. And he's kind of still on that road to recovery. He was Penance for a long time. Number 4 Angel Angel is another mutant superhero who has gone through a ton of different looks in life. Most notably was his shift from having organic wings to techno organic wings after he lost his organic wings when he became one of Apocalypse's horsemen. The crazy thing is that while Angel seems to appear as mostly his original version, there are times where you might be confused with him as to who is who, as he seems to kind of alternate right now in modern comics between his original form and his techno organic form, Archangel. As far as I can tell, this hasn't been fully explained yet in the comics, though it has been acknowledged that this happens in a similar manner to his ex corp partner, Monet. That is, when he gets more emotional or gets more angry, his techno organic form seems to come out. This was alluded to at the end of issue 2 of X Corp, their Hellfire Gala issue. And if there have been more explanations, on this and I miss them, please feel free to tell me what issues I should in depth read. Because, yeah, I feel like there's little details, but we haven't gotten like a full. Here's how it is, let me break it down for you. Number 3 Nick Fury While Nick Fury does look very different in modern day comics in comparison to classic comics, it is important to note that technically these are two different characters. Well, technically, these are kind of like three different characters or four different characters. There's a lot of characters. The version of Nick Fury we saw in the MCU was actually inspired by the version of the character from the Ultimate Universe, who, fun fact, was also inspired in terms of appearances by Samuel L. Jackson, the very man who would end up playing him. In fact, a lot of the MCU characterization and even stories are inspired by the Ultimate Universe, the alternate reality of 1610, and the stories that went on there. The original Nick Fury of Earth 616 was actually a white man, but he would inevitably be replaced by a 1610 inspired alternate Fury after the original Nick Fury of 616 ended up kind of being transformed into a Watcher. The 1610 version of Fury and Samuel L. Jackson's take on the character would then be adapted for Earth 616, the main comic book continuity, and that's how we would get Nick Fury Jr., who is the son of the original Nick Fury from the comics and looks a lot like Jackson's 1610 inspired version from the MCU. See what I mean? There's lots of Nick Furies. People are like, Nick Fury changed. And I'm like, Nick Fury didn't change. There's just a lot of characters that 
came together. Number two, Beast. Beast is one character that has gone through a massive amount of change since we first met Hank McCoy, the lovable vocabularian, scientist, and the X-Men's most bouncy team member, Beast. Back then, Hank was just a relatively large man with enormous feet and enormous hands, but his mutation continued to progress long after that first appearance, changing when he ended up forced to take a serum that he had created based around the hormone that causes mutation. As such, he mutated even farther, which became permanent after he didn't take the antidote quickly enough to thereafter revert the effects. This meant that Hank was now permanently even more muscular, agile, and now completely covered head to toe in gray fur. From there, his fur would become more blue, and over the years, his appearance has become borderline lion-like or even kind of cat-like at times. Number 1. Star-Lord Considering how much Peter Quill has changed with each era of comics, it could be hard for fans to recognize him in modern day. Once again, his appearance and power levels have changed so, so much. In his initial appearance compared to his modern look, he's basically unrecognizable. And if we go even farther back to the Peter Jason Quill of the 1970s, the Star-Lord of Earth 791 now, he is completely different. It should be noted though that shortly after the main continuity version was introduced, Produced in Thanos issue number 8, which came out in 2004, he was shortly after pretty radically changed when he appeared a few years later in Annihilation Conquest from 2007 to 2008, which is pretty much the version of Quill roughly that we have today. Although even then, he's still changed quite a bit. Quill more recently in the comics returned from Marinus, an extra dimensional world where he lived unaging with his friends, partners, and his lovers, Moors and Aradia for hundreds of years. He came back even more powerful than before he had left, and ended up joining forces once more with the Guardians of the Galaxy to defend the cosmos against the return of the Dark Olympian. Number 10, Deadpool. Deadpool has gone through phases where he was fully cured of his power set and even pretty once more in the comics, like back during Daniel Way's Deadpool run, looking completely normal but without his healing factor. But the most startling shift when it comes to Deadpool's appearance has to be between his on-screen adaptations. That's right, we're talking about the comparison between Deadpool's cinematic debut in the X-Men Origins Wolverine film and his own self-titled film franchise. Although oddly enough, both roles feature him played by Ryan Reynolds. The two adaptations could not be more different. Thankfully in Deadpool 2, Wade Wade manages to fix Cable's temporal dial. Using this device to time travel, Wade is not only able to save Vanessa, who initially died at the beginning of that film, but is also able to clean up the timelines by killing the previous version of himself, who is also known as Weapon 11. It should also be noted that in X-Men Origins Wolverine, Deadpool appeared fully as a villain, as opposed to the lovable mess of an anti-hero we've come to know him as within his own film franchise. Number 9, Rakil. Rakil. I never know how to say this name, but I'm pretty sure it's like Rakil. How do you say scroll names? That's the question. For some reason, probably because she had been gone so long, Rakil, aka the Skrull Empress, aka Emperor Doric the Eighth slash Hulkling slash Teddy Altman's grandmother, was completely unrecognized when she returned. Rakil was revealed to be alive and well, and also sleuthing it up as she impersonated Tanalt the Pursuer, an elite member of the Kree forces. And apparently. Rakul had been impersonating Tanalt so long she had in essence created her persona and basically was her. Rakul had actually been plotting and planning in secret, putting in place all the pieces to bring together the Kree and Skrull Empire, uniting them in an alliance in order to ensure her grandson was the one to rule over the now allied empire, as we saw in Empire. That's the name of the event, so not to be redundant. It was an empire, but it spelled empire with the why because it's a whole other thing. And yet when she was revealed in that event to be the one revealed as the scroll pretending to be Tanalt, many Marvel fans actually needed to crack open their comic history books and review just who exactly she was, with many people mistaking her for Varonki, the scroll queen. But yes, this is Rakul. She was believed to have died when the scroll homeworld perished along with her daughter Princess Enel, as their world was devoured by Galactus. She made her first appearance in the Fantastic Four original series in issue 206 and was believed to have perished in issue 257. But she didn't! She was still alive and then she came back years later and everyone went, who is that? What? Veronki? What? 
not Veronki. Two different people. Number eight, Craven the Hunter. You might think you recognize Craven, but do you really? After all, the current Craven that you've seen turning up in the current Beyond storyline of the Amazing Spider Man series is actually none other than Craven's last son. Well, his last clone son, anyway. This clone of Craven was given the name of Last Son after he hunted down all his other brothers, his other clone brothers, who had also been trained by Sergei Kravinov, the Craven himself. As such, this clone of Craven was named his true heir, and since then has also taken up the mantle of Craven the Hunter. So while he may look like Craven, albeit a younger version of him, this Craven the Hunter is not actually the original. So I guess this is a character that you would recognize but in so doing, you'd be wrong, which means I guess you didn't really recognize him then, did you? This version of Craven made his first appearance in the current run of The Amazing Spider-Man, which started in 2018, first appearing back in issue 16 as The Last Son. Number 7, Zemnu. Zemnu made his first appearance in Journey into Mystery in issue number 62. We learned that Zemnu was actually a prisoner and a criminal who was retrieved and accidentally revived by a human and electrician named Joe Harper. Zemnu would go on to be become known as Zemnu the Living Hulk and would also prove to be a powerful cosmic, psionic, and all around bizarre enemy to the Hulk and the Hulk family in time. Initially, he clashed with the original superhero powerhouse team known as the Defenders. Zemnu in his first appearance has brownish or reddish fur, but currently has reappeared in the comics with white fur, making him look kind of like a space yeti. You may not recognize him because you forgot him, or because he's just so weird, or it could be just because of of this change when it comes to, you know, his overall fur color. But yeah, he's got different, I guess he dyed his fur? I don't know. What happened there? Number six, Hulkling. Hulkling is another hero who looks pretty different from his first appearance. He used to have a bunch of ear piercings, but I guess he can shapeshift, so it was easy for him to close them all up. I guess he was just like, I'm not into it now, and they're gone. Hulkling was much more gruff looking, I'd say, in his first appearance with the Young Avengers. However, he also had the name Hulkling. I mean, he still has that name, but I know that name has nothing to do really with the Hulk, but still, in his original appearance, he's big, he's green, and he's kind of like the Young Avengers own version of that character. Because, you know, everyone's kind of mirroring someone. Though to be fair, Teddy Altman is very much his own character and his own person, like many of the other Young Avengers. Currently in the comics, Hulkling isn't just a hero, but is also the Emperor of the Skrull slash Kree Alliance. The Skree Alliance, if you like. And this new role has also dramatically changed his overall outfit and appearance. He looks super cute now! Not that he didn't before, of course. He's just a a different kind of cute now than he was before. Also, he like has totally different hair. His hair now is blonde. It was black, but also shapeshifter, you know what I mean? Number five, Dazzler. Alison Blair has had a ton of different looks over the years, and there have been countless points in her history when you may have not recognized her. If you've been invested in modern comics for some time, then Alison's current outfit is Dazzler, which she also sported in Way of X issue number three, the morning after the Hellfire Gala, will likely be recognizable to you. However, if the last time you saw her was in, you know, her own solo series back in the 80s, then you might be confused as to even who this character is. And if you saw her back in 2015 and were familiar with either the present or past appearances of Dazzler, or if you're familiar with that Dazzler, I really doubt that you would recognize her in the present day. There's, there's many times when you'd be like, who is that, depending on which Dazzler you know. There has been a tendency to try and have Allison change with music trends, instead of keeping her in her somewhat, I guess, outdated disco roots. But personally, I think disco can still be a valid genre today, I still love disco, and I'd love to see her even return to that iconic silver jumpsuit. I like that Dazzler's had so many different looks, that's crazy. Number 4, Professor X. When we think of Professor X, usually a lot of us probably reflect back to his look in the 90s animated series. In fact, many X-Men fans who have seen Professor X recently would probably wonder just who they're even looking at. If you are more familiar with his appearance in the 90s, both in the animated series and in the comics, the modern Professor X might throw you for a loop. Currently, Professor X is able to walk again and happens to be sporting not a suit and, you know, a blanket on his lap, but instead an all black skin tight one piece. Also, he always wears Cerebro now, obscuring his recognizable face and his bald head. But yeah, that was Professor X then. 
and this is him now. Number three, Nature Girl. Nature Girl is amazing. She's one of my favorite of the newer mutants to come out, and recently she has become a lot more metal, both in approach and in her appearance. Nature Girl can basically commune with nature, which often means she can encourage animals to help her, and they actually seem to feel within Nature Girl a kindred spirit. So there's a lot of empathy going on there between both sides. More recently in the X-Men Unlimited Infinity comics, we saw that Nature Girl has been in a constant state of depression and duress, feeling the pain that all nature is currently feeling due to humans polluting and just generally mucking up the planet and its natural and carefully balanced ecosystems. This forced Nature Girl to go on an adventure to fight for what she believes in, which resulted in her uh, kind of accidentally killing someone and then losing all of her hair, just sporting her antlers as she turned to the dark side and took on oiling operations, aiming to destroy them and anyone who wouldn't renounce their loyalty to them. This is not your friendly neighborhood nature girl, that's for sure. Nature girl then, nature girl now. I love her new dark look though. I, I love both versions of Nature Girl. I think Nature Girl's awesome. Number two, Green Lantern. Green Lantern, like the Flash, isn't even really the same person anymore if we are comparing modern day to classic. In fact, unlike the Flash in the main continuity event, Green Lantern has more than one modern counterpart. Who was the original Green Lantern? Well, that would be Alan Scott. Alan Scott made his first appearance in All American Comics issue number 16, where he looked very different from our modern day Green Green Lanterns, and at the same time, even kind of was a completely different Green Lantern in terms of, you know, where his powers came from and kind of how they worked, at least until later on when his power's origin was somewhat retconned. The modern day Green Lantern I'm sure most would think of is Hal Jordan, but there has also been Guy Gardner, Jon Stewart, Kyle Rayner, Jessica Cruz, and more recently Joe Moline, one of my favorite Green Lanterns, and that's just some of the mainstays of the Green Lanterns who hailed from Earth. There are a lot more as well. We've really expanded on Green Lanterns. So now when you say Green Lantern, I feel like instead of people being like, oh yeah, Alan Scott, or oh yeah, Hal Jordan even, people are like, which one are we talking about? Number one, Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel was originally introduced to us in the comics as Carol Danvers in the late 60s. Carol herself worked with the US military as a member of the Air Force before becoming a security officer for NASA. It was there that she would meet her super heroic mentor and at one point her love interest, Marvell. Eventually, Carol would get power of her own in the 70s, debut as a superhero herself known as Miss Marvel. Based on that first appearance of the heroic character, we've come a long way in terms of her appearance and even who she is as a person. Carol isn't even Miss Marvel anymore, having gone on to take up the much passed around mantle of Captain Marvel in honor of the late Marvel himself. Although, as I said, it wouldn't just be Carol and Marvel that would use the name Captain Marvel. With Miss Marvel available though, Carol ended up giving her blessing for Kamala Khan, Carol's number one fan to use the mantle as she started on her own heroic journey. In the comics, Kamala is known as an inhuman with the power to basically modify her form and shapeshift to an extent. So we're all familiar with Trapster, right? Peter Petrusky, the incredibly intelligent chemist who fights with pretty much a high powered glue gun as well as other adhesives. Well, there's a mysterious woman taking on his moniker. Not much is known about this new Trapster, but she's actually the third person to take on this name. Cool thing about her is that she ditched the E in Trapster because who needs the E? It's 2022. It just looks cooler. This version of Trapster first appeared rudely interrupting a fight between Spider-Man and Vulture, and she robbed the winged villain of money he had just stolen. This may have seemed like a good thing, but she didn't like give the money back. She's now a member of the all-female crime syndicate, the Sinister Syndicate, having been recruited by Beetle. Number 9, Sin Eater. Sin Eater is Stanley Carter. While his costume may have remained uh, somewhat the same, actually pretty much the same, his appearance more recently in the comics drastically changed after he was resurrected by Kindred, who were actually revealed to be the twins. The twins being Sarah and Gabriel Stacy, who in turn were revealed to be clones created from the genetic materials of Gwen Stacy and Norman Osborn. So, not their naturally born offspring. Yay. Then Sin Eater died, then was resurrected again. The second time Stanley was brought back after he'd taken his own life, he appeared in a zombie like state, making him almost unrecognizable from his usual appearance, barring the fact that his costume has remained pretty much the same since his first appearance. Although, after rising from the grave the second time, 
His costume is pretty tattered, so I really think some people might have been like, who dis? So, as we stated before, there is a new channel we have out now called Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. So if you're into that sort of thing, give us a follow and subscribe. We're putting out videos every day. This next master of the hunt is the ruthless son of Sergei Kravinov, simply known as Kraven the Hunter. The last son of Craven. Sergei Kravinov, the original Craven, wanted to carry on his legacy. So instead of having more children, because that would just take too long, plus he already has a daughter, he decided to create a whole lot of clones of himself, 87 to be exact, and attempted to train them in the ways of the hunt. Well, this current Craven got his title by murdering all his brothers, which, hey, if you want to prove you're the apex predator, killing 87 clones of Craven the Hunter is a great way to start your career, isn't it? He also saved the skulls and brought them before his proud dad. The son made his dad even more proud when he strangled his father to death while he was disguised as Spider-Man, thereby breaking his curse of immortality. The son has now taken on his father's moniker, Craven the Hunter, as well as his actual name. Good job, buddy. Number seven, Kane Parker. Kane Parker was initially a clone of Spider-Man who, yes, was considered to be, um, kinda evil. Chiefly because Kane didn't have any qualms with killing people, leaving them with his mark of Kane, which typically was used to kinda like burn the face of his victims. And also because he had long hair and was more moody than Spider-Man. Which is a feat, because Spider-Man's a pretty moody dude. In reality, the mark of Kane was actually just Kane using his spider climbing like little hooks on his hand, as we saw showcased visually in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, to burn his victims' faces. Kane was also seen as evil because he was mentally unstable, having been a defective clone who was rapidly deteriorating, which basically affected his mind. However, Kane is now known as Scarlet Spider and has a completely different look and attitude when compared to his original appearance and presentation in the comics. While still being, you know, somewhat edgy because he's still Kane, he's definitely still more of a hero now in the comics than he ever was before. The original Super Adaptoid created by Advanced Idea Mechanics or AIM, was originally a villain facing off against Captain America, Iron Man, of course the Avengers, also going up against the X-Men. It was able to mimic and visually copy anything it wanted, giving it a hero's abilities and powers. But in Amazing Spider-Man 900, however, Spidey faces off against a different version of this shape-shifting entity known as the Sinister Six Adaptoid. This version of the character sports a brand new look, most prominently featuring Doc Ock's tentacles, but there are other visual elements in the character's design as well. The Sinister Six Adaptoid is an amalgamation of sorts of, you guessed it, the Sinister Six, having the abilities of Doc Ock, Vulture, Craven, Mysterio, Sandman, and Electro, the Sinister Six had been captured by the Living Brain and their powers and sentience combined to form the villain. So if you thought these guys were strong on their own, imagine going up against all of them at once. Spider-Man actually needed help the real Sinister Six in order to take this abomination down. Go figure. Also, I love when villains like team up with the hero just to like, because they both hate the same person. It's just fun. Number five, Killer Croc. We got our first look at Waylon Jones, AKA Killer Croc, in Detective Comics number 524. In this version, he had a medical condition that gave his skin a rough, scaly appearance, earning him the nickname Killer Croc. In his first appearance, Croc is actually pretty cunning, being able to rise almost to the top of the Gotham underworld. His physical appearance is also pretty tame, being gray and scaly, but still clearly a human being. As he made subsequent appearances, not only did he get dumber, but his look became more and more exaggerated until he eventually looked like an actual crocodile, with green scales, sharp teeth, and sometimes even a tail. His size in the original comics is large, but still within believable human proportions, whereas at this point, he is so tall that it's hard to imagine any skin condition resulting in a villain like Croc. Number four, the Green Goblin. Arguably Spider-Man's greatest foe is the Green Goblin. First appearing all the way back in Amazing Spider-Man number 14, the Green Goblin had a pretty consistent look for most of his career, sporting a purple and green costume with a horrifying grinning goblin mask with a purple hat. He flies around on a bat-shaped glider and throws exploding pumpkins at Spidey. Over the years, Norman Osborn has had a few different aliases and therefore costumes, such as the Iron Patriot and the Goblin King, but it's usually not long before he's back in the green duds. More recently though, he's trying to be a hero and is wearing a white and gold bodysuit and going by the name
same gold goblin. The glider kind of gives it away, but based purely on the costume, would you think this is the same guy? If that's not different enough for you, just take a look at the Green Goblin in the Ultimate Universe, where he is more like a Hulk than the classic villain. Number three, Victor Freeze. This classic Batman villain was very different in his first appearance in Batman Volume 1, number 121. He was a scientist who suffered an accident that forced him to wear a specialized cryo suit that kept his body temperature below freezing. He soon began committing crimes, not as Mr. Freeze, but as Mr. Zero. His original look was a green and pink bodysuit with a bubble-shaped helmet feeding him cold air. When the character was adapted for the 60s television show, he was renamed Mr. Freeze, and this name eventually was brought over into the comics. His look began to evolve closer to how we now know him, but he remained a rather C-list villain until the 90s animated series revamped his origin to be a tragic figure trying to find a cure for his sick wife. This interpretation was so popular that it was also brought into the comics. The character is now very different from his original appearances, but it is interesting to see how much he has changed over the years due to his adaptations in other media. Number two, Catwoman. I know, there are a lot of Batman villains on this list, but that is mostly because they tend to be a much more consistent group of villains than a lot of other heroes have, and also because they're the best comic book rogues gallery by a country mile. First appearing all the way back in Batman number one in 1940, Catwoman was very similar to her modern personality, being a brazen and flirtatious cat burglar. In this first story, however, she doesn't dress as a cat, but instead uses various disguises to steal a jeweled necklace from a boat and is simply known as the cat. In her next appearance in Batman number two, she is still not wearing a full-on costume, but is referred to as Catwoman for the first time. When she shows up again in Batman number three, she finally gets a costume consisting of a long flowing yellow dress, a red cape, and a literal cat head mask. In Batman number 35, her costume evolves more into something that we today would recognize as Catwoman with a purple dress, green cape, and less intense cat mask. The look stayed the same after that for a few decades until the comics took some inspiration from her look in the 60s TV show, and she ended up in the skin-tight cat suit that has evolved into the look we all know and love today. Number one, Thunderbolt Ross. For most of his history, since Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross first appeared in Incredible Hulk number one, he has remained pretty much the same. He's an angry, mustachioed general obsessed with capturing or killing the Hulk. He stayed this way for decades, being a constant antagonist in the Hulk stories, but the status quo changed in 2008 when he joined the group of villains known as the Intelligentsia, who helped transform Ross into the Red Hulk. Since then, Red Hulk has been both villain and hero, but if you saw the original Ross next to the Red Hulk, you would have no reason to suspect that they are one and the same. At number 10, we have Dreamer, or Dream Girl, who doesn't quite resemble the way she used to appear in the original comics. That's because in the CW series Supergirl, Neuronal is now Nia Nal, and aside from her costume making a decent change, the character is actually actually quite different as well. Most notably, Dreamer is known to be the first transgender superhero to appear on TV, played by Nicole Maines, who is herself a transgender activist. But that's not all. The character is also quite a bit younger, and I mean, her hair isn't even blonde anymore, which I think is fair to note. She doesn't look quite the same. But either way, from the name change to the costume change to even an entire color palette shift, Dream Girl, now Dreamer, has metamorphosized into someone completely different. At number nine, we have Elongated Man. Not the most widely popular superhero to begin with, Elongated Man takes a rough turn in the Arrowverse when his costume is entirely reimagined in The Flash in one of the worst ways possible. Although he's sort of played off as a joke character in both the comics and the Flash series, it's still sad to see such an unimaginative portrayal of any hero, really. Although Ralph Dibney is mostly out of costume, he becomes known to be the worst dressed within the narrative of the show as well, throwing more oil on the fire of Elongated Man's meme ability. But even aside from the costume, the character just appears much less boisterous than he typically does with a younger disposition and somehow a down-to-earth vibe, even though he's elongated man. At least in the way that he appears serious while he's in costume. A total departure from the goofy exaggerated image associated with elongated man in the comics. At number 8, we have Swamp Thing. This newer version of the character from Infinite Frontier is just insane. With the new host, Levi Command, May, Swamp Thing takes a whole new turn in how he's presented. Well, not entirely. To be fair, Swamp Thing has always kind of been this big, nasty green monster, but something about this modern depiction of how the green takes over Levi's body turns what used to look like a big green 
and Beast into a massive green spaghetti monster, it looks like. An extremely terrifying spaghetti monster, to be exact. Although the character doesn't appear for long in the short-lived series, this is the most recent update we have on the Swamp Thing, and he's surely taken on a different vibe than he used to. Hat number seven is Connor Kent. Con L is one of the many people to take on the mantle of Superboy, and it seems like his look has changed more than your average hero. He's also known to be a clone of another more real son of Superman, which I suppose leads him to run into some identity issues, which could be part of it. But he most often appears to look like this high school bad boy with the spiked leather jacket look, but he's also got the black and red super suit, and at times has also presented a lot like the classic Superman with the blue, red, and yellow costume as well. But that's kind of my point. It's hard to know whether you're looking at Con L or John Kent, or even another Superboy from an alternate dimension, because he doesn't seem to have decided on one look, and he's pretty hard to recognize, especially these days as his time goes by. At number six, we have Wonder Woman. Now, a couple newer comics make this hero a bit different than what we're used to. During a one-shot in 2020 called Future State, the Wonder Woman mantle is taken on by Yara Floor, who takes the place of Princess Diana while she's away for a time. Sporting a totally new costume with a handful of different weapons, this iteration of the hero just gives us a totally new look at who Wonder Woman could be. More recently, near the end of 2021, a younger iteration of Yara Floor appears in the Infinite Frontier series as Wonder Girl, offering the new status quo of what the DC Universe might look like moving forward. But aside from the Wonder Woman mantle being taken on by a new character, there is another series that leads right up until the end of 2021 called Wonder Woman Black and Gold, in which multiple different art styles are employed to give us a totally new aesthetic to the Wonder Woman story itself. Although there is a continuation of the traditional Wonder Woman storyline running into 2022, there are also some alternatives to the character that have been released right up until this year that give us a whole new look into how the character could be portrayed. Number five. Electro. The main Electro we've known for years is Maxwell Dillon, but there is a new Electro on the scene. This new Electro is Francine Fry. She was once the accomplice and love interest of Max, who died as a result of her love for him, and her obsession with villains and kind of her lust for them. While Max's powers were less in his control, Francine threw caution to the wind and decided to kiss him. Their kiss would result in her being electrified to death, however she'd later be revived by Ben Riley, operating as a villain the Jackal as part of a plot to help control Electro into basically doing his bidding. Turns out the DNA Riley used to resurrect Francine in clone form was actually a mix of Maxwell's and her own as a result of that kiss, allowing her to harness and absorb electricity, chiefly the power of the suit that a depowered Max had at the time been given. Kissing Max once more, Francine absorbed the suit's powers, accidentally killing him in the process and becoming the new Electro. Max has since been resurrected, so now even more confusing, we have two Electros technically running around. Up next, we're taking a look at Richard Fisk, now known as the Rose. The son of Wilson Fisk, aka the Kingpin, Richard would boast about how rich and powerful his father was, thinking he was just a highly successful businessman. Now, even if that was the case, like, come on, don't go around boasting about your parents' accomplishments. Live your own life. Well, that's exactly what Richard decided to do. Upon discovering his father was actually the kingpin of crime, Richard faked his own death and took on the moniker of the schemer, attempting to take down his father's empire. The two would eventually reconcile after Richard felt bad about putting his dad into a coma. Fair enough. But this brings us to Richard's next moniker, the Rose. He now sported a purple mask and kept a rose in his front pocket and worked under his father but secretly wanted to dismantle the Kingpin's organization from within. After killing a policeman in a shootout, however, Rose just realized he was a bad dude and allied himself with his father again, but then changed his mind and wanted to take over Kingpin's organization again. Just kill your dad or don't, man. It's a decision we all have to make at some point in our lives. Number three, Grey Goblin. Gabriel Stacy has been known by a few different names throughout the years, and has also had his backstory um, somewhat altered. Initially, we knew Gabe Stacy as Grey Goblin, and later as American Son in Age of Heroes. Originally, he was introduced to us as the son of Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy, who basically had a secret love affair which resulted in the birth of two twin babies, Sarah and Gabriel. However, when Gabriel and Sarah were revealed to be the mysterious demonic villain returning from hell, known as Kindred, 
1800, we learn that they were actually never really the natural born children of Norman and Gwen, thank goodness, but instead were clones that Harry Osborne had made, using their genetic material to get back at his father, tormenting him and making him think the two were really his children, when actually they weren't. It was all Harry's plot. Ha ha ha. Not only did Gabriel have a completely different look as Kindred, but he also got a completely different backstory that explained away all the weirdness of his and Sarah's original origins. Which I mean, thank you for that because wow, that was that was bad. It's not good. I don't want Norman to sleep with Gwen. That's I'm not here for that. This next baseball player turned villain is known as Frederick Myers, aka Boomerang, and he's gone through several changes. Having worked under criminal organizations like the Sinister Syndicate as an assassin, going up against the number of heroes, and of course Spider-Man. So how did this Boomerang wielding baddie change? Well, he ended up aiding Black Widow, Maria Hill, and the champions in their fight against Hydra, and cut a deal to get a full pardon for all his past crimes. That's pretty sweet. He later became Peter Parker's roommate in an attempt to get closer to Spider-Man as he was attempting to find the pieces of the Lifetime tablet. Though Boomerang was lying about his true motives to Spidey, saying he was only after the tablet to keep it away from Kingpin, this was quite the opposite actually, he was working for Kingpin. Despite his deception however, Frederick actually formed a close bond with the hero and would go on to sacrifice his own life to save him during a fight with the vampiric villain Morlock. Number 1. Green Goblin Norman Osborn is often known as the villain the Green Goblin. One of Spider-Man's most iconic villains, if not the most iconic rogue he happens to have in his gallery. Their rivalry is an old one, going all the way back to the first appearance of the character in the 1960s, where Osborn actually first appeared not in his civilian form, but simply as the villain Green Goblin. But lately, Norman has had a change of heart, if you can believe that. It most certainly won't last forever, or at least I'd be very surprised if it did, but currently in the comics, Norman is actually one of the good guys for a change. This is after he had all of his sins purified by the villain known as Sin Eater. Initially, Peter as Spider-Man had saved Norman from Sin Eater, but after being taunted about Gwen, couldn't help but toss Green Goblin to the villain to be devoured. Which, I mean, fair enough. But instead of perishing, Norman survived the encounter, no longer driven by madness, guilt, or rage. Having been purified, he was seemingly given a new lease on life, and currently remains one of the few villains purified by Sin Eater to stay that way. At least, so far. Number 10, Spider Woman. Jessica Drew has returned to her more classic look now in the comics, with a few upgrades though, but prior to that she was rocking an entirely new look in the beginning of the current Spider Woman run. Love it or hate it, I personally loved it, her new inverted black, red, and yellow suit has been retired for now. But let's talk a little bit about the look and where it all came from, yeah? Spider Woman ended up reaching out to get a new suit made when she decided to take on some bodyguard work to make some cash, and she thought to herself, hey, I can't wear like my regular suit, I'm gonna need a new suit for that. Because being a hero is great and all, but it doesn't really pay, and Jess does have bills to pay, and baby Jerry to look after. Although she does have Roger's help, I think children are in most cases a job for two salaries in this economy, like minimum. Ronnie of Big Ronnie's Custom Battle Spandex made this new suit custom for Jessica, but under the instruction of someone who wanted to also monitor Jess's vitals. This comic is so good I will not spoil that reveal for you if you want to go and read it. All I'll say is that you should give this new look and new comic a chance and check it out. And don't worry. Jess's classic look does return in issue 11. Number 9, Gilgamesh. I love Gilgamesh's new design actually. Gilgamesh is not an internal who has made a ton of appearances, but he is back in the newest series and sporting a new armored look in comparison to what we knew him to look like originally. This new design for the character kind of reminds me of Black Bolt if he were a luchador, but I mean that in the best way possible if that makes any sense. Gilgamesh here looks intensely intimidating in comparison to when we were first introduced to him. His armor was still cool then, made I believe by Sprite in issue 13 of the 1976 Eternal series, but in comparison to the modern day, it's kind of dated. Back then, he rocked a full bodysuit with purple or hot pink lining, depending on what color you see when you look at that. And here in the present day, even the patterning for the lines of a suit is an improvement. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more updated looks, roles, power sets, all of those cool things, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel has currently been going from cosmic to mystic in her own series as she seeks to defend herself against her one greatest weakness. 
magic. In order to do so, she returned to her friend and former one night stand, Doctor Strange, for help. But when he and his colleagues all turned her away, Carol was forced to look elsewhere. Her new costume kind of alludes to this more magical time in her life and features a pretty cool cape, I gotta say. I do dig it. It definitely seems to take some inspiration from the whole Sorcerer Supreme look. Over the course of her current series, Carol has actually had more than a few new looks, including a Kree inspired suit, which she also sported during Empire when she became a Kree accuser, and the red and black suit the Vox Supreme bonded to her, also making her hunt down the Avengers. Her newest magical inspired suit is introduced in issue 28 of the current Captain Marvel run for those interested in checking it out. Number 7, Hippolyta. Hippolyta is now filling in for her daughter on the new Justice League team, leaving the ruling of Themyscira to Nubia, who has taken up her place as ruler. And with this shift, we also have gotten a completely new redesign for Hippolyta. To be honest, I almost didn't recognize her at first myself when I when I first saw this like redesign. She's given up her regal clothes for a white and gold bodysuit, although admittedly she is still keeping a version of her crown while out on the battlefield with the current Justice League. Her tiara here comes in the shape of an eagle, which also makes it look similar to Wonder Woman's W shape, which I love. Hippolyta also wears a royal sash, which extends up to a sort of one shoulder cape number. These pieces help to allude to Hippolyta's history and royalty while also updating her outfit to more fit in with her new role as one of Earth's greatest heroes. Of course, that is just, I assume, the look we are building to. When Hippolyta first shows up in the new Justice League run, she is sporting a much more regal looking costume, which is purple and gold, which I, I actually really love that costume. I know we're probably going to this white gold thing. But I really like this purple costume. Number six, Norman Osborn. While you might currently recognize Norman Osborn in terms of his appearance, when it comes to his actions and his alignment, you might not. And in modern comics, Norman has also gone through a couple dramatic redesigns and makeovers in recent history. At one point, Norman gets plastic surgery to completely change his facial appearance, reinventing himself as Mason Banks and becoming the head of Alchemex. There's even an unmasked point where we're all kind of like, wait, who's that? And then he's like, I changed my face, but it's me, Norman Osborn, aka also Mason Banks. He also has been the head of Hammer and his own Dark Avengers, and for a time posed as their version of Iron Man, tarnishing the mantle of Iron Patriot. And more recently, a depowered Norman bonded with the Carnage symbiote, allowing himself to use the Goblin Serum once more, but ultimately being driven insane by that whole experience and believing himself to actually be prime carnage host and serial killer Kalidas Cassidy. Now sane again, however, and seemingly purified by the Sin Eater, currently in the comics, Norman is on a path of redemption, having gained a new lease on life and being cured of his usual villainous intentions. Or so it would seem. I never trust Norman, but that's what's up currently. Number 5, Galactus. One villain who recently got a very mummy inspired looking makeover was Galactus during his time in Thor's latest series as written by Donny Cates. Here in the first arc of the 2020 Thor series, referred to as volume 6 overall of Thor, Thor takes on the immensely powerful cosmic entity known as the Black Winter. Because the Black Winter is so powerful, Thor is forced to team up with Galactus to defeat it. Unfortunately, he also learns that Galactus is actually kind of a herald for the Black Winter. FYI, that is just how powerful of a force the Black Winter is. He has Galactus as a herald. After devouring five planets to bolster his own power, Galactus has this power stripped from him by Thor upon this revelation. Thor leaves Galactus drained of the power cosmic, wrinkled and de-armored, even taking Galactus's helmet as a trophy, using it as the entrance to his throne room. So while you might have recognized him previously, Galactus then got super upgraded and now is very mummified and also very dead. Oof. Number 4, Onslaught. Onslaught initially was a villain with a mysterious background. Despite the fact the powerful villain looked a ton like Magneto and seemed to pack a psionic powerhouse of abilities that echoed an evil Professor X, the character's true identity as really both of those mutants wouldn't be confirmed confirmed till after his initial appearance. When Onslaught appeared again, it was in a similar vein, and while the symbol of Onslaught might be similar, this time around when it came to the character's identity, they were even less recognizable as it was explained that 
basically all the mutants of Krakoa were in a way Onslaught, and that Onslaught was able to exist through their constant resurrections. So while you might recognize the look of Onslaught when they returned, their true identity was even more of a mystery than the first time around. And their final form that we saw during X-Men The Onslaught Revelation was pretty wild as well. Getting a bit of an update to match even the current character designs of what an amalgamated Charles and Eric would look like currently. I like that that version of Onslaught has like the black suit to now the tight black suit that Charles wears. It's a look. Number 3, One Below All. I think one of the biggest revelations of modern comics was learning that even a being as good as the one above all, who is basically considered to be like Marvel God, has a dark side. The one below all ended up being a major villain in the Immortal Hulk series, and we later learned that their power actually came from one of the most divine and good beings in the Marvel Universe, the one above all. The one below all is like the Hulk for the one above all. In other words, their darker and much more destructive other half. So while you might know the one above all, and you might know the one below all, I bet you'd be surprised to learn that they were actually directly connected to one another. They can't exist without the other, especially given how different in appearance and alignment they both are. But this revelation was also super powerful and fitting for a series that was really all about forgiving and reconciling the darker side of the Hulk, the Hulks, and ultimately of humanity and our own individual selves. After all, we all have like a little bit of a Hulk side to us. Number two, Killmonger. If you go on far enough back, Eric Killmonger easily becomes one of Marvel's villains you would not soon recognize. And that goes both ways. Whether we're talking about more recent fans looking back in comic history to his first appearance in Jungle Action, volume number two, or whether we're talking about his initial fans looking at his modern MCU adaptation and comic redesign, which obviously takes inspiration from the MCU version of Eric. Killmonger made his first appearance in the second volume of Jungle Action from the 1970s in issue number six. And even from that front cover, he just looks like really different. Here, Eric does not sport any self-created bodily scars marking his kills, but instead comes with a lot of spiky accessories, including what appears to be a spike belt, which he uses as a weapon to fight against his foe and his rival, Black Panther. All the spikes. Now he's got scars, but back then he had spikes. Number one, the leader. I doubt after all this time, if the leader even really recognizes himself considering what he looks like now. Following the events of Immortal Hulk, the leader is left no longer a supervillain, but just a guy. Throughout the course of the series, we saw the leader only grow more evil and more powerful, it seemed. He was eventually basically influenced or possessed by the one below all, the most powerful of all Hulk-related baddies, and possibly the baddest of the bad just in general. However, after the two beings were separated from one another, Stearns was left as just a man, returned to normal. The Hulk decided to forgive the leader and he returned back to the earth with all the other Hulks and Bruce Banner. It's been a long time, but Sam Stearns is no longer the leader, at least not currently in the comics. I mean, he could return to being the leader at some point. Instead, Samuel Stearns is just Samuel Stearns. Kicking off the list at number 10, May Parker, Earth X. Venom from Earth 9997, aka May Parker, is quite unique when it comes to taming the symbiote. In Jim Kruger's Earth X run from 1999, May Parker chose not to keep her fantastic abilities passed on to her a secret. She embraced them, which is something I would do, I think. She was actually trained by Uncle Matt, Matt Murdock that is, to use her spider sense as if it's a radar. Things were going swimmingly until she became the target of the symbiote, the same symbiote that had been used by her father years prior. Peter rejected the symbiote at first, so now it was a little upset, and it swore revenge on the Parkers. It left an older Eddie Brock and made its way to May. Thing is, when the symbiote did bond to May, her spider sense training came in handy, and she was able to subjugate the symbiote and take control. We love a hot start, but it might get worse. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and tap the thumbs up, if you want to, no pressure, but it really does help us out quite a bit. You guys are the best, thank you for your support. Let's get back to this list. Number nine. Kingpin Venom. If I took one look at this guy in real life, I'd probably throw up out of fear. 
Wilson Fisk, straight out of Earth TRN 421, appeared in the 100th anniversary special Spider-Man issue 1 back in 2014. A rich guy who wants power. Where else to look than to get your fat sausage fingers on a symbiote? That's exactly what Kingpin did. In fact, he upgraded it. That's right, he added techno-organic improvements to the symbiote that gave him access to any and all tech on the planet. And that includes your recently deleted, so you might want to go check those are gone. When Eddie Brock and Peter Parker were duking it out, they both came to a conclusion that they should just destroy the symbiote. But that's when Kingpin came along and kidnapped the two. Great idea, guys. Just a little too late. I love Kingpin Venom. When he's chasing Peter down, he's controlling tech and using it against him. It really is the worst case scenario for Pete. Peter managed to escape the beast by luring him into the woods and starting a fire. There he was able to get the symbiote off of him. See, normally forest fires are a thing you try and avoid, but in this case, with the whole tech stuff, I think we can all agree it was Peter's only choice. You get a pass this time, Pete. Number eight, The Punisher. Taking a peek into the What If series, Volume 2, Issue 44, to be specific, we find the Venom symbiote taking over Frank Castle rather than Eddie Brock. This was the most people the Punisher has ever taken out in one run. It is extremely violent. I mean, right off the bat, Frank finds Rocky Vance, a guy robbing investors with his inside trading. A guy who was about to take over the electronics industry, and now he doesn't have a face. Awesome. So after this, people obviously start to freak out, guns are drawn, and Punisher Venom starts to figure out just what is it he can do. Webbing? Okay, cool. Can it do bullets? Okay, good to know. The symbiote tried to take over Frank's body, but Frank vowed to end his own life if that was the case. So that's how he remained in control. That's the golden rule. Just put your life at risk, and then the symbiote will play along. Just don't tell Don Fortunato that. Number seven, Venom Saurus Rex. Oh, what? Okay. A Venomsaurus Rex can be seen in the pages of Old Man Logan, and while it's a spectacle on its own and really doesn't need any more explaining to be cool, I'm gonna explain it a bit more, because it's cool. Old Man Hawkeye actually gave us a little bit more of a backstory for this goopy nightmare in issue six. So we see the T-Rex before its alternate version is born, just a regular scary old T-Rex. Now, it swallows Venom, and for a hot moment, the daring duo believe they've actually gotten off the hook. Imagine if the Venom symbiote bonded with one of those long neck dinosaur boys Honestly, I think any dinosaur would be terrifying, but the T-Rex, oh, I'm shook. Number six, Aquaman. Aquaman's new look just kind of seems to be a nod to Jason Momoa's portrayal and the design for that character. Mainly, his newest costume features green pants with a belt with a symbol on it and well, I guess tattoos. The other thing you might notice if you are reading the Justice League and checking out Aquaman in there lately is that he's kind of gone back to being a weaker character who's a bit of a joke. Overall, I'm not too sure how I feel about this one. I guess it all boils down with this redesign as to how much you are into Jason Momoa's version and whether or not you like your Aquaman to be more powerful or less powerful. Someone throw some water on that Aquaman. He's dying. Number five, Leanne Harper. Leanne Harper has returned to us in the comics as one of Catwoman's group of street kids, if you can believe it. In DC Festival of Heroes, the Asian celebration out of 2021, Leanne makes a triumphant return to the comics. Here she sports dyed blue hair and calls herself Shoes. She doesn't remember her childhood or who her real parents are. She just remembers one evening where her mom, Cheshire, carried her to safety and her mom's mask. I don't think she even really knows who Cheshire is, it seems, at least in this story. I don't even know if she knows that that was her mom. It's all a little unclear. In the story Masks, this single memory and the mask that she saw in it inspires her to become a hero herself. Attempting to remake the mask from her dreams, she takes up the mantle Cheshire Cat. The last time we knew Leanne, she was just a child. She was believed to have died at a young age, but it seems that she somehow survived and now suffers from amnesia in regards to her childhood. It'll be really cool to see how that develops and where Leanne shows up in the comics. I'm excited for it. Number four, Brew. I love Brew, and I am so happy he's gotten such a boost to his power levels. Brew is one of the alien mutants to have joined the X-Men. He was found by them as a young, abandoned brood. He was considered defective by his kind. Normally, these kinds of brood that are born into the world are killed, but because populations were so low at the time, he was spared. What was wrong with Brew in the brood's eyes? What makes him a mutant? He's capable of kindness and compassion. Brew's mutant power as a brood is basically friendship, which admittedly on paper sounds kinda lame, even though 
I personally love it. But after a run in with the Brood, who were chasing down their king egg, Brew ended up becoming their new ruler and king when he ate said egg. Meaning that now, yes, he is in charge of all of the Brood in the cosmos, which is pretty impressive. So you might recognize him in terms of his overall look, but you might not recognize him in his new role as king when you see him in the comics. But get ready to, because that's that's happening. That happened. It's great. To read about when this development took place, check out issue 9 of the 2019 X-Men run. And if you want to sort of see the beginning of that, you might want to also check out issue 8. 8 and 9 basically. Number 3, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman has been through quite a journey in the comics that started back in 2020. She was one of the heroes to go up against both the Batman who laughs and his master Perpetua. His sort of sort of master. And Wonder Woman got Perpetua's powers not only once, but twice during the Dark Knight's death metal event. Although the first time around she failed in being able to confidently use them to save everyone, the second time around she made sure to intercept those powers before they could move into the Batman Who Laughs, who was currently in an alternate Batman Dr. Manhattan body and known as the Darkest Knight. The second time around Wonder Woman managed to use these powers to defeat the villains and rebuild the universe. Winning the day for our heroes heroes and giving us a glimpse into the future to come in future state. Wonder Woman now has basically become one with the cosmos and for her good deeds was granted a nice long cosmic nap by the hands. How nice. We could all use a long cosmic nap, could we not? <laughs> I know I could. I could definitely use that. Take me to space and let me sleep on along the stars. That'd be great. Number two, Captain Kate. Call me Kate is the new tagline for Kitty Pride as she reclaims the mutant team name Marauders and sets sail as their leader in the group book Marauders, which primarily centers around Kate, Emma Frost, and Storm. Seriously, I love this book. It is so good. Becoming a captain and the new Red Queen of the Hellfire Trading Company inspired Kate to take up an entirely new look, which means that you might not recognize her if you were just picking up a random issue of Marauders or gazing at one of its covers. Personally, this is a look that I think is worthy of all of the cosplays. Everyone must become Captain Kate now. Number one, Roy Harper. You might not recognize Speedy if you see him anywhere recently in the comics. Especially as the last time we saw him in the comics, he was killed by Wally West in Heroes in Crisis. So he was looking pretty dead. And he remained kinda dead even when Batman as a Black Lantern revived him and many others during the events of Dark Knight's death metal. Green Arrow's companion is now becoming more cosmic than ever as he becomes more associated with the Green Lantern's world, becoming himself a Black Lantern. How or why did this happen? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Roy was being attacked by new villain Extract, who claimed that Roy didn't belong in this world. During this attack, he was knocked out, and when Roy came to, he found himself with a Black Lantern ring in a Black Lantern uniform, learning that alternate energy construct versions of himself were the ones who had come to his rescue and saved him. And then he kind of also learned sort of why he was a Black Lantern, sort of. Has to do with Dark Side. You should check it out. It's it's a cool thing. It's a cool thing that's happening, and I'm interested to see where it goes. I think it's gonna lead us to Leanne too. Yes, father and daughter reunited. Number ten, Harley Quinn. While Harley Quinn's character design and costume has been changed, it's pretty similar to a lot of looks we've seen her in in the past. Mostly, what we're seeing in her new series is a change to art style, and with her new role as Batman's ally and sidekick, a complete shift over to the side of being a hero. Harley is a of course still bringing her unique approach to heroism, so don't panic if you are a fan of Harley's wackiness and standout personality. But considering where she came from being Joker's sidekick, this is a pretty big change to her character as we originally knew her. If you've been out of the comics for some time and aren't quite as well versed in Harley Quinn's history, you might not recognize her in 2021 as she's gone from full villain to full hero. Number 9, Poison Ivy. Over the last few years, Ivy has gotten a few pretty drastic redesigns. So if you are reading her in 2021 from anywhere along her recent history in the past 3 to 5 years, you might be a little confused when it comes to her look and ask yourself, wait a minute, is that Ivy? Also who's Queen Ivy? We've seen her go from eco villain to hero and environmental activist and spokesperson to dead to alive and split down the middle between those two warring personas, the villain and the hero. 
when we literally got two Ivies. Then from there she became Queen Ivy and got a complete redesign when it came to her costume. Now she's back to wreaking havoc on Gotham, or is she? Time will tell what alignment we'll see for Ivy in the future. But either way I'm here for the ride. And friends before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want to learn about more cool redesigns and updates to characters that we've seen recently, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Especially in the Batverse, I feel like there's so many bat characters that have been introduced and redesigned, it's awesome. Number 7, Black Mask. Black Mask not only has a new look and redesign, in future state that is, that I must admit is spectacular, but he also got a power upgrade during the Year of the Villain event. Black Mask was given the ability to change his identity with the added upgrade of an identity changing mask, which is pretty powerful. Also his suits have gotten admittedly a lot more stylish over the past few years. So for those who remember his classic look, Roman Sionis may have the same mask, but the rest of his look also seems to have received an upgrade. Number 6. Clint Barton So while Clint may have evaded the symbiote's grasp in Old Man Hawkeye, he wasn't too lucky in the alternate reality of Earth 32323. Beginning with Civil War Volume 2 Issue 2, Clint Barton came into contact with it right after the death of Mac Gargan. After that, Venom Clint was recruited by Peter Parker in order to infiltrate the Iron, Tony's war zone following the superhuman Civil War, in order to steal supplies for a beast to finish his weapon for Project Bell Curve. So he agreed, but upon landing, the group was attacked by Stark Sentinels, and Elektra lost her life. So far this mission was a rocky one, but anytime Venom's involved, it's at least going to be dangerous, or else, you know, what's the point of reading it? Number 5. Demon. Great name. Coming in hot from Earth 5101, Pavatar Prabhakar made his first appearance in Spider-Man India issue 1. Pavatar moved to Mumbai with his Aunt Maya and his Uncle Bim to continue studying. He got half a scholarship and was determined to keep the success going. His best and only friend for that matter, MJ, Mira Jane, stood by his side. He got his powers through an ancient ritual, which I gotta say, I think that's way cooler than a spider just going on the hand. Now Lean Oberoi, a crime lord of this alternate reality, used an amulet to get himself possessed by a demon. That demon was determined to hold the door open for other demonic forces afterwards. So Pavatar, while being chased by bullies, ran into an ancient yogi who then gave him the powers of a spider. Which sounds great, but when you find out that in this reality's Venom is a century old demon stuck in an amulet, you get a little nervous for him. Demon Venom was freed by a cult called the Neo Alvers, and once he was free, nearby towns were just obliterated. You had to set the name Demon, I'm not gonna lie. Number 4, Aaliyah Bell. Making her first appearance in Venom 2099 issue 1, Aaliyah Bell was injured in a crash. The same crash that ended her mother's life, sadly. Now these origin stories are so tragic, it's like you know what's going to happen yet you're still thrown off when you read it. She was raised by her father Theo Bell and Aaliyah was having a hard time at school. Some students were bullying her because of her scars on her arm. Those kids are jerks, don't be like those kids, it's rule number one. Aaliyah was selected to go under this experimental treatment developed by Alchemax scientist Dr. Russell, but during this treatment she saw these visions of an ancient dark god. And all these humans bonded together to create this massive chunk of pure darkness. She wasn't having a pleasant go, but her arm, on the other hand, was now back to normal. So she at least felt a bit better in some way. But while a confrontation unfolded with this mean punk rock wannabe chick in school named Bether, a black tendril reached out of her hand and cut off the Alchemax monitoring bracelet. And that was just the beginning. You gotta be better, Bether. Stop bullying people. Number 3. Ben Grimm Fresh out of Earth 51838, making his first haunting appearance in Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man, issue 304, Ben Grimm became the head guard of a prison for superhumans, of course under the commands of President Harry Osborn. Okay. While there, that's when he came into contact with the symbiote and became this monstrosity. While the resistance broke in the prison to break out Doctor Doom, they had to now go head to head with this Venom thing, literally Venom thing. Nice try guys. Number 2. Ngozi. Ngozi was an excellent track star. She began her comic run in Venomverse War Stories issue 1. One frightful day however changed her life forever. She was involved in a horrible bus crash which in turn paralyzed her from the waist down. Really heartbreaking premise as are all of these really. She was outside one day trying to catch a grasshopper for her bug collection afterwards and that's when she bonded to the Venom symbiote. The symbiote beforehand had been evading the grasp of Rhino, but when Black Panther was killed in the battle, Ngozi convinced the symbiote to work with her in order to protect those residing in Lagos. 
The Dora Milaje saw all of this go down. They saw the courage in this new Venom, so they recruited her into their ranks and into Wakanda, where she would then get another life-changing upgrade into that of the new Black Panther. Number one. Gwenum. Shooting over to Earth 65, Gwendolyn Stacy made her first appearance in Edge of Spider-Verse issue 2 simply as Spider-Woman. But by time issue number 24 rolled around, Matt Murdock wasn't a helpful ally. In fact, he was a bit evil. Yeah, he created the Venom symbiote in this world, so when Spider-Gwen came into contact with the symbiote, Gwenum was now born. Matt Murdock ordered Alexei Saitskovic to go after her father. The poor guy was beaten into a coma. So Gwenum embraced the dark side here, but you can't really blame her. Also, Gwenum's design alone worth taking a look into, and you could do so yourself starting with Spider Gwen Volume 2, Issue 25. It's at Matter Eater Lad. The reason you might not recognize the absolute DC icon that is Matter Eater Lad is because you're lame. No, actually, the last time this character appeared was over 10 years ago in the pages of a Supergirl comic from 2006. Seven. Matter Eater Lad was in essence the hungriest of hippos but a human. Able to eat anything and everything he wanted. Like need a hole through that chain link fence? I got you. You need this door out of the way? I got you again. This guy just got to eat and honestly I, I think it was really iconic. But there is always, I mean there's actually like a person in real life with these powers if you can believe it. This man would eat light bulbs and nuts and bolts and he like actually ended up eating like a whole bike and at one point like a small plane from what I remember called Mr. Eats All. So if you really want a way to not recognize the most famous superhero ever, Matter Eater Lad, check out Mr. Eats All. It's basically the same thing. And at 9, Batman. The Arrowverse Batman may have an iconic voice in Kevin Conroy, but the version of Batman introduced in the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover on Earth 99 is not like any version of Batman you probably remember. I mean, except for the Kingdom Come one. He was the cousin of the late Kate Kane and Beth Kane, who spent his lifetime protecting Gotham City as the vigilante Batman, stylized as the Dark Knight. Unfortunately, this Bruce succumbed to his homicidal urges and killed the majority of his enemies, including this Earth Superman, whom Bruce's xenophobia caused him to incorrectly perceive as a threat. His career was thus seen as a reign of terror and its end celebrated. He also killed the Joker, the Riddler, and Mr. Freeze. Despite his moral decline, Bruce was believed to be the paragon of courage, until it was revealed that it was actually Earth 1's Batwoman who became the paragon after protecting Earth 38th Supergirl from the misguided fallen hero, accidentally killing Bruce in the process. Although, I under I don't understand why they thought Bruce was the paragon of courage, because you know, he took on Superman without any powers, which realistically should have gotten him killed. In an eight elongated man. In the pre-Flashpoint timeline, Ralph was one of the 17 people who lost his life during the Star Labs particle accelerator's explosion. However, he reappeared alive in the post-Flashpoint timeline, gaining his powers due to exposure to dark matter from the Speed Force when Barry's team got him out of the Speed Force prison. Using these powers, Ralph joined Team Flash and began acting as a meta-human vigilante and superhero, initially referred to by the media as the Stretchy Man, but shortly thereafter being named Elongated Man. Well, while his powers may have all been a part of Devo's plan, the prototype suit that Ralph wears certainly wasn't, since this is one of the most cringily horrific suits in the entire Arrow multiverse. I mean, like, that was the point of it. The characters even ended up making fun of it in the show, but that doesn't excuse the fact that if you saw this suit and were a fan of Elongated Man, you'd still have no idea who he was. Not to take into account the majority of casual fans who might watch the show who wouldn't know who Elongated Man is to begin with. And it's 7 Batwoman. Okay, so this is a bit of a cop out, but hear me out, okay? Kate Kane is Batwoman. No news there. But after season one of the Batwoman show, the actress playing Kate, Ruby Rose, left the show for at the time undisclosed reasons, later revealed to be horrific working conditions for not only her, but the crew as well. So they replaced her with Ryan Wilder, a new character who would take on the Batwoman mantle since Kate left Gotham. The latter returned, but with a new actress and the explanation that she had been disfigured when her private jet exploded. So honestly, in the most serious definition of the phrase, you wouldn't recognize her if she hadn't been introduced as Kate. Plus, she eventually gets brainwashed and turned into Cersei Sionis and, and given an entirely new face, so yeah, you won't recognize this version of Kate Kane. Number 6, The Freezes. That's right, not only does Freeze get a new redesign, but he also gets a huge change in the fact that he was joined by his family, becoming a little super villain fam jam unit all their own. Two separate units, really. In the main continuity, Mr. Freeze was given a serum by Luther that allowed him to make his long-lasting wish come true. He was able to revive, cure, and become reunited with his frozen love, Nora, who also ended up joining him in a life of crime. 
Yay! However, while it all started out sweet, their reunion would quickly turn sour when Nora became resentful of Victor for making so many choices for her and, in her eyes, trying to control her. Victor blamed the serum for her change of heart, but I mean, who really knows? I feel like Nora's kind of got a bit of a point, even though I feel really bad for Victor in this scenario. In Batman issue 96, we are treated to an alternate Victor Freeze who commits crimes alongside his sons as a little criminal family unit. Super cute. Number five, Man Bat. While so many supervillains are getting power upgrades, additional allies, and more horrifying redesigns, Man Bat is going the other way with it. Man Bat is Kirk Langstrom, who ends up joining the Justice League Dark and gets a much more adorable character redesign as a result. He looks a lot less monstrous and a lot more humanoid and cute. Kind of geeky. It's great. He even wears a bow tie. Ah! This is likely a redesign meant to symbolize Man Bat having tackled some of his personal demons and his move more towards a heroic role as opposed to a completely tortured soul and uncontrollable monster. Number five, Scarecrow. Scarecrow already looked pretty terrifying in the comics, but now he looks intimidating as well. Very intimidating. Not just maniacal and crazed. We got a fresh look at the Scarecrow redesign in previews for Infinite Frontier, and then in all his glory in the actual comic itself in issue zero. Here, a Scarecrow appears to wear a gas mask with straw or sticks coming out of his head, almost like a crown. He is armed with long fingernails or claws at the end of his gloves, evoking a sort of Freddy from Nightmare on Elm Street feel, especially as these claws seem to be directly connected to vials of fear toxin, which have tubes connecting to Scarecrow's headpiece? That's what it looks like to me. I think the idea is possibly that Crane is producing the fear toxin himself from his own mind and sending it down to these vials to be dispersed whenever he manages to scratch an enemy with one of his needle pointed claws. All in all, it's a pretty intense look that might leave you asking who this character is, but kind of in a good way as I consider this redesign to be an upgrade to the villain. Number 4. Catwoman Catwoman in Batman Earth 1 has come in with a wild new look that will leave you floored. I mean, you will admittedly still recognize her, just not as the Catwoman that you're used to seeing. This version of Catwoman, instead of wearing her typical black or dark purple cat suit, looks a lot more noticeable and, and bold by comparison in terms of her design, especially for a thief. Here we see Catwoman donning a purple crop top and hot pants with striped thigh high socks. She still sports a purple color motif at least though, so that helps with the recognition. Also she has a paw print belt buckle and a cat mask, a literal cat mask, and she's got a cat on her shirt. Still, this look and redesign for the character is definitely very different. Very unique, I would say. Number three, Bane. Really, Bane's daughter goes by the alias of a vengeance, but she definitely looks and seems to be following in her supposed father's footsteps. Bane's daughter was first introduced in the new Joker series in issue number two, and is revealed to be the daughter of the supervillain who went through a series of experiments to give her super strength like her dad. Her mission is to get revenge for his death, and she's doing so by hunting down the Joker, who she and many others believe was responsible for the events and many deaths of A-Day. Her father, who was in Arkham Asylum at the time, was one of the victims of that attack and died. So Bane Jr, aka Vengeance, is out for blood. Number 2, Clayface. You really won't recognize Clayface in the new Batman Earth 1 volume. Clayface is not very recognizable here in terms of the story as he is disguised for most of his appearance and in terms of his character design. Near the end of the story we learn that Adrian Arkham, Bruce's grand Grandfather, who returned from the dead, was in actuality Clayface in disguise. <gasps> We're all used to seeing more of a giant mud monster when it comes to how Clayface is depicted, but instead, here we get a very kind of, I don't know, smooth looking, baldy figure in the end who appears to really kind of just be a man. Like a man who can shapeshift, but just a guy. Like a guy who, if you saw him on the street, you wouldn't run in terror from him or anything. You might just notice his skin was like a little odd looking in terms of its texture, but that's about it. Other than that, he looks pretty average. Number one, Two-Face. The Earth One version of Two-Face sees the character completely reinvented in a way you might not have expected, which is what makes it so great. On Earth One, Harvey and his sister Jessica are working together to clean up Gotham alongside their good friend, Bruce Wayne. After Harvey 
ends up dead, however, Jessica and Bruce are forced to continue their mission to eradicate corruption and crime in Gotham without Harvey, working on in his honor. But Harvey lives on in more than just their intentions. It turns out that Jessica develops a disassociative personality disorder, in essence becoming her brother due to the trauma of his loss. At least that's what it seems like if we had to explain it on paper. Although never explicitly called Two-Face, the duality of this version exists in the goodness of Jessica and the contrasting ruthless aggression of Harvey. Honestly, the story is so good, you really need to check out the new Batman Earth 1 Volume 3 because even knowing where this story goes, even though I just told you that part, it's still an amazingly compelling read. So. Go read it, even though you kind of know spoilers now. And at 10, Jim Gordon Batman. In the wake of Batman's apparent death against the Joker, plans for a new Batman were discussed, with Powers International laying the groundwork for a Batman inspired task force. Their first candidate chosen to model this program was Jim Gordon, of course, who was initially hesitant to fill Batman's shoes, but eventually agreed. Going through intense government training and getting surgical muscle implants, Gordon was given the first model of a new Batman robot armor, which he nicknamed Rookie, and took to the streets as the new Batman. By complete chance, he ends up finding Bruce Wayne and informs him that he's taken up the reins as Batman. As Gordon hears several different reports about Bruce Wayne being found dead throughout Gotham, he works with Batman to figure out that a Batman from an alternate dark universe, known as the Batman Who Laughs, is the one responsible. Tracking him down, Gordon seeks help from his estranged son, James Jr. However, another dark version of Batman arrives and introduces himself as the Grim Knight. But it's certainly jarring to see Batman go from like this big bulky hero. To, to the lanky and sorry to say, old Jim Gordon. He even he even looks fragile. And at nine, Wonder Girl. Yara Flora from the tribe of Amazons from the Amazon is the new Wonder Woman in Future State, who, in the absence of Princess Diana, came out of obscurity from the heart of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil to protect man's world from the magic that is within it. Yara Flora is a demigod who hails not from the island of Themyscira, but from the Amazon rainforest in South America. She has a faithful winged steed, Jerry, and along with her friend Kapora, a forest guardian spirit, Yara travels to the Underworld to rescue one of her Themyscarian sisters from the clutches of Hades, the Olympian god of the dead. <laughs> yeah, a sister that she's never even met before. Yara is also an active member of the Justice League, although the new rules of the Justice League forbade fraternization amongst its members as a way to protect them individually and not have to go through the same tragedy that resulted in the dissolution of the previous League formation, Wonder Woman and Superman, John Kent, ended up becoming friends. It's also worth noting that despite always willing to work with her colleagues in the League, she, she She's not happy to be a part of it. And it ain't Superboy. Now this seems like it's cheating since there are multiple people who use the Superboy mantle. However, the one that had the most makeovers has seemingly been Con L, otherwise known as Connor Kent, with an E, because they're not cool like I am. If you read one version of Connor and then read a couple series later, you might not realize what's been going on. This man has gone through more looks than any teenager getting ready for a date in a Disney Channel movie. Not to mention the time where he merged with Spider-Man after Spider-Man somehow defeated him. Superboy was created by Project Cadmus using Kryptonian DNA, intended as a replacement for Superman, who died fighting Doomsday. Artificially aged to his mid-teens and implanted with the equivalent of a high school education, Superboy was set free by the New Boys Legion before he could actually be implemented with safeguards to control him. One of the boys gave him a leather jacket before he set out to the city, where he had his first encounter with a villain when he found Sidearm attempting to steal money from an ATM. But since then, he's gone through like two other costumes and a load of different centuries, the most recent version coming from like the 30th century. So, yeah. And it's seven, Hippolyta. Hippolyta is the queen of the Amazons and ruler of Themyscira. She is also the mother of Wonder Woman. In the Harley Quinn animated series, Queen Hippolyta first appears in the episode Bachelorette, after being enslaved by Eris, who takes control of Themyscira and turns it into a spa resort, planning to sell it to Lex Luthor. However, Harley Quinn discovers her plan and, along with her friends, takes down Eris and saves the queen and Themyscira. To thank them and celebrate their victory, she throws a rager. And in Something Borrowed, Something Green, the queen appears as a guest at Poison Ivy's failed wedding to Kite Man and the old Gotham Corn Factory alongside some of her subjects. But the Queen of Themyscira being mind controlled, th that seems fairly ridiculous, okay? Even if she was mind controlled by the goddess of Discord, at that point, she might as well have just been able to tell us what games our friends were playing, okay? Harley Quinn, like, they, they discovered her plan and took her down as a part of her bachelorette party for Poison Ivy. But if they, if they could do that, how could Wonder Woman's mother not fight her off? Seems kinda lame. And it's Dick Superman. 
Superman. Calvin Ellis, the Kryptonian named Kal-El, also known as Superman, is a Kryptonian president of the United States on Earth 23. On this Earth, he became Superman in addition to being the president. It is likely that he's native to Vathlo Island due to his reference to the word Vathlo. He operates from the White House where Brainiac serves as his personal computer and even covers for him when he's out doing stuff as Superman. And has recently made another appearance after Infinite Frontier, helping Justice Incarnate protect the multiverse. Or I guess the Omniverse. Calvin Ellis was based on Barack Obama, the 44th President of the United States. Prior to being elected though, he once joked on TV that he was sent to Earth from the dying planet Krypton by his father Jor-El. He was later added to Final Crisis number 7 as a version of Superman. Writer Grant Morrison confirmed that the character was intended to be Barack Obama, and much like Obama, he's back when we needed him the most. So, glad, glad this version of Kal-El is back. Halfway through into number 5, Firestorm. Firestorm is the name used by transmuted people that were mutated by the Star Labs Particle Accelerator in a specific manner, who end up becoming the Nuclear Man. The first duo to form Firestorm was Ronnie Raymond and Martin Stein, but after Ronnie's death and Martin Stein's failing health because of spending a significant amount of time on Merge, Team Flash were able to track down Jefferson Jackson to substitute for Ronnie. And for anyone who knows Firestorm as Ronnie Raymond, you'd certainly be confused as hell while watching Legends of Tomorrow. At least if you didn't watch Flash first and understood what was going on. Since Jefferson, as far as I can tell, was a character created for the show since they killed off Ronnie Raymond. I believe that they did this because they wanted to use Firestorm in their planned spinoff for Legends of Tomorrow, but knew that Ronnie as a character would not be willing to abandon Caitlyn again after being separated from the love of his life for so long already. So in essence, they had to kill him off to use Firestorm and Legends, which is unfortunate, but I guess kind of understandable. In for Wild Dog. On the night that Damien Dark was killed, Renee called child services and asked to see his daughter, only to be rejected multiple times. After seeing Dark's death at the hands of the Green Arrow on TV, though, he was inspired to take justice into his own hands. So Renee began acting as a vigilante, which really isn't going to help you get your daughter back, dude. However, his antics were disapproved by the Green Arrow, who warned him to stay off the streets. But of course, Renee didn't listen, and this is most of his character. When starting out, Wild Dog's costume was probably the most accurate in the Arrowverse. However, in Season 6, his upgraded suit was very much not an upgrade, according to some fans. Like, I get that you want comic-accurate suits. I understand that. I do too. But the inability to let characters evolve and grow in the show or movie or medium that they're being presented in is very confusing to me. Like, yeah, start off with something comic accurate, but then move on to something else because I, I want new stories. I want an adaptation. I want to see new spins on these characters. If I wanted everything to be comic accurate, I'd read the comic again. <laughs> like, I don't know what's the point. Like, why would you want so many things to be exactly the same? Why don't you just want cool stories, like more things that these characters can do that doesn't rely on any of the previous history. I liked his season 6 suit and was disappointed when he actually went back to his original one, however that was in part due to his equipment being locked up after being confiscated by the FBI, so... They made a good reason in universe as to why he went back to his old one, but it seems more realistic that he'd have the other one, because you know, a jersey isn't really bulletproof. Getting close to the end in number 3, Green Lantern. First appearing in Far Sector number 1 from January 2020, Sojourner Jo Maline is a member of the Green Lantern Corps. She's assigned to a sector so far from O that she's not sure if it's even been numbered, and she just refers to it as the Far Sector. After the first two months that she was at City Enduring, Jo had a relationship with Sins of the Cliffs, a not female, which didn't work out very well and they preferred to continue as friends. And she recently became involved with Marth of the Sea, a not male. Jo is also a reader of the website Tales of Our Own, a parody of the fan fiction site of Our World Archive of Our Own. Ha, she's also a fan of anime, so basically, just an awesome person turned into Green Lantern. But if you say Green Lantern, people typically think of Hal Jordan or maybe even Alan Scott. But Joe Malign is certainly another one that we should add to the roster and keep our eyes on, especially because her suit is pretty sick. Number 2, Taskmaster. Taskmaster is Anthony Masters and is known for being an unstoppable foe. He can master pretty much any skill he can observe. Some would say he's a taskmaster, which makes him a deadly opponent. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we were also introduced to Taskmaster, but the character was changed somewhat for the film in which they were introduced, Black Widow. Instead, Antonia Drakov, the daughter of General Drakov, the man behind the Red Room, was Taskmaster. When Black Widow left the Red Room and became an Avenger, she believed she had killed Drakov, sadly also having to kill his daughter, who basically led them to their target. 
she was a casualty of the explosion, intended to kill Drakov himself. Instead, Antonia was actually badly injured and ended up surviving, but her face was permanently scarred. She then became Drakov's weapon, having studied the moves of the Avengers and having their fighting styles basically uploaded into her brain, allowing her to mimic all their various moves and making her a hard opponent for Black Widow to defeat. Quite different from the comic book version, but still really cool and badass as an alternate version of the character, I think. Number 1. Cyber Cyber has come a long way when it comes to his look in the comics. Granted, Cyber has also come back a lot of times, so I guess it kind of makes sense that he would look different. He made his first appearance in Marvel Comics Presents in issue 85 in the 90s, where he was introduced to us as a cyborg appearing Wolverine villain who was hired by General Koi, another enemy of Logan's. Back then, he was just a smile and a coat with a hat on. Currently, however, his design is much different, and he doesn't even go by the name Cyber anymore, instead being known as Hornet in the comics in his newest body. 